Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming in person. My name is um, Dr. Ina Park. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco in the Department of Family Medicine, as well as the principal investigator of the California Prevention Training Center, which is co-hosting this event today with San Francisco Department of Public Health. Thank you to you who braved all of, you know, traffic, et cetera, to come here and be in person. We're really excited to have you. I wanna do some um, sort of housekeeping first. Um, one issue is, is that the logistics of this room and how it's laid out are kind of interesting. The bathroom is actually over here at the front. So if you need to go to the bathroom during someone's talk, yes, we will all know what you're doing, but you know, we all have sympathy for that. And so let's not say anything to each other and um, take care of your bodies whenever you need to. The only way to get back in is you can go all the way around, but you know what? We saw what you just did, just come back through the front door. It's totally fine. Um, so anyways, we're, we have such a great lineup for you here today. I'm going to go over the agenda, but before I do, I just want to thank our audience members here and the first person who actually showed up this morning, I wanted them a special award for the hardcore STI, STI lover, Daniel Oliva Contreras. Are you in the audience? Yes. Okay. I'm giving you a present. Yes, penis stress relieving toy. <laughs> yes, come and get your prize. My book about STI is called Strange Bedfellows, which I will sign for you later. And a city clinic beanie, <laughs> so you can show how proud you are of sexual health in San Francisco. Thank, Thank you for you. being first. Appreciate it. <laughs> Woo! Okay. What's on the agenda? Okay, introduction and welcome. That's me. That's what you're doing right now. Then we're gonna have um, STIs in San Francisco. It's gonna be a larger programmatic overview of what's happening in the city by Dr. Stephanie Cohen. Then we're gonna do a fun STI Derm talk by Dr. Kelly Johnson. Um, and then a break, we'll be giving out more prizes, a case panel with Franco Chevalier, as well as Benjamin Prince and Terry Marcotte. And then uh, please remind me of the name of the- and uh, Mar Marion Pellegrini from our cousins over at Strut Magnet and then a DoxyPep update from Dr. Oliver Bacon, and then closing with more prizes by me. So just um, a little thing we have to do for housekeeping for CME purposes. By the way, I just wanted to note that if you showed up here this morning, um, registration is still gonna be open for the next hour. And Elizabeth Olson, who probably, oh, is standing up in the back and waving. You'll need to register um, via a registration link that she can text you. So go and find her before 10 a.m. if you want to register for this and get CME credit. And for the online audience as well, would they be able to email you, Elizabeth? And I will... Link is in the chat. Yeah, the link is in the chat for those of you who are on the online audience who want to register at the last minute, which I've done more times than I care to admit. So a little bit about the California Prevention Training Center, which is co-hosting this event today. We're a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. We've been funded by the CDC for over 30 years. And so um, we're a member of eight regional training centers throughout the country called the National Network of STD Prevention Training Centers. So we do in-person events like this. And for three years, we did a lot of virtual events as well. And we're really focusing you know, on STD prevention, diagnosis and treatment. And I will show you as well, um, run a consultation service that I um, highly encourage you to use. If you wanna learn more about us, there's links below. Onto that consultation service I wanted to mention, it's the stdccn.org. Most of the questions are about syphilis. You're welcome to ask us anything about any STI, but you can put in your consult online and let us know how soon you would like a response. And we are happy. If you don't have a phone a friend, you know what I mean? That uh, for syphilis or other STI questions, please consider us your friends and uh, send us your consults. The other thing that we're piloting, CDC has asked us, um, which is not as huge of an issue here in San Francisco versus in the Central Valley of California, for example, but a congenital syphilis hotline pilot. So people who are dealing with a pregnant patient who might be hospitalized and you know, not sure what to do with the baby, what treatment they should get, whether or not the baby is okay to be discharged from the hospital. Um, both Kelly and myself, as well as a few other consultants are answering same day consultations with Kelly doing probably 90% of them, but um, 
we will try to call you back. We try to call you back right away um, and at the very you know outside two hours if we happen to be with patients or busy, but uh, we try to get back to you immediately. So um, that will also go through the stdccn.org and say that you need an urgent consult. I am not going to read this, but these are the financial disclosures that we are required to show you. Um, you're not required to be tested on them or anything, but um, just to let you know that any of the presenters or planners were asked about disclosures and to disclose any commercial interests, as well as a standard CME disclosure that we also need to show you by our CME provider, the wow. University of Nevada, Reno. Okay, so you're gonna get almost four hours of CME credit for this event. Um, and nurses are also eligible to receive CME credit. We don't have a separate nursing units, but um, most of the time the nursing board will accept CME. But at any rate, um, it says registration is closed or Elizabeth is leaving it open for those of you who came in last minute. And you need to attend the update uh, live and in full. So we will record this and post it, but watching it asynchronously after the fact doesn't qualify you for CME. And so you, if you complete the post-course survey evaluation by March 22nd, then um, you will then get a um, email with the link to your certificate. And just make sure that you make uh, training at nnptc.org one of your safe and trusted senders so that it just doesn't go to spam. So at any rate, um, you'll get the post-course survey evaluation 24 hours after this update. And so you will receive your CME notification by April 19th. And here's another address. If you don't get emails from UCSF, if they get blocked, you know, please add um, CAPTC at UCSF EDU to your um, safe senders. Sorry, I know this is all very exciting, but it's something we have to, it's something we have to do. Everybody's gonna get access to the slides. So the hundreds of people who are online with us, as well as those of you in the room, they're gonna be available two weeks after the update. So no anxiety about taking notes if you wanna see the slides later, as well as a recording. Um, do not, you do not need to email about, um, about those. We're gonna get some emails anyway, we expect it, but I just wanna let everybody know. Again, add us to your safe senders. So during the Q and A, um, then there's, there's gonna be Q and A on for those who are in our virtual space. So there's a Q and A icon, which uh, looks like this. I think after this many years of the pandemic, we all know what it looks like. Go ahead and send your questions. Attendees can submit questions up until the last two minutes, of the Q and A section. And so um, we are gonna be having microphones turned off on the, for the online audience. So unfortunately, Q and A is your lifeline to communicate with those of us in the room. So I did say you don't need slides. Um, we're gonna send them to you. But if you have other questions about CME or this event um, or whether or not you qualify, et cetera, Elizabeth Olson, who's in the back, who just waved to you a few minutes ago and who's still there, is going to be able to answer your questions. She's Elizabeth Olson. She's waving again. So if you didn't see her, she's in the back. Elizabeth Olson at ucsf.edu. So for those of you in the virtual space, Please reach out to Elizabeth if you have lingering questions. The woman, the myth, the legend, Dr. Stephanie Cohen. <laughs> she's like the head, she's the head cheese now. She's the um, director of the STD and HIV prevention section in SFDPH disease prevention and control branch. She's uh, an associate professor now. So this bio slide is old at UCSF in the division of ID. She's an HIV primary care provider. She was one of the, um, you know, we were one of the sites and she was um, the site PI for the DOXYPEP study that you guys are probably all familiar with and we'll hear more about. And she's a good friend too. She's a fantastic person. So I'm so excited we're gonna hear from her. All right, welcome. It's wonderful to see so many of you here this morning and hello to everybody who's joining us virtually. Um, thank you so much, Ina, for the kind introduction and to the California PTC and to our S, um, STI program staff, Allison Decker and Mika Zaragoza Soto who have been essential in helping us um, plan this event for this morning. So I'm going to kick us off with a talk um, reviewing epidemiology and program updates. And then the rest of the morning is going to be more clinically focused with some incredible talks from um, a number of clinicians and that work in our um, team. 
And I know many of you are not necessarily based in San Francisco, particularly those of you who may be joining virtually. So my EPIAN program updates are going to have a San Francisco focus, but I think many of the trends and disparities and challenges that we're facing here in San Francisco are also things that are happening in your jurisdiction. So I hope um, much of this will be relevant to you and your work as well. So I'll again focus first on a review of the epidemiology of HIV and STIs in San Francisco. I'm going to talk a bit about like what does the health department do? How, what role do we play in supporting sexual health? What's our mission and framework? And I'm going to highlight some of our key programs, many of which um, folks in the room or folks um, virtually support because none of this work happens alone. It is truly a partnership with clinicians, with clinics, with community-based organizations, and with community as well. So I'll start with the review of EPI, um, starting with HIV, because we are really thinking about sexual health in a holistic framework and trying to think about integration of HIV and STIs wherever we can. This slide shows the number of HIV diagnoses, deaths, and prevalence in San Francisco from 2006 to, 2000, to 2022. The red line represents the number of new HIV diagnoses each year, um, and the yellow line represents the number of HIV deaths, and the blue bars are the number of people living with HIV. What I want to um, highlight for you here is the unfortunate stalling in progress that we've seen over the last few years. So from 2017 to 2019, we saw a 28% decline in new HIV infections. Um, but from 2019 to 2022, we've seen only a 12% decline. I'm just gonna test my, uh, see if I have a pointer. I do, it is the yellow button. Oh, okay, good, just, that's good. Um, okay, and um, we have, there's over 15,000 people living with HIV who were San Francisco residents at their, the time of diagnosis. Not all of those people are still living in, H, in San Francisco. Some of them have moved to other cities or states or countries. Um, but of that population, we know that um, almost three quarters are 50 years of age or, or over and 41% are 60 years of age or older. So we know that one of our um, phenomenon we're seeing in HIV is an aging population, which means an additional set of um, healthcare and social needs. Deaths from HIV have been gradually increasing since 2016. And the good news is that HIV related causes of death are declining as we're getting people diagnosed earlier and getting people on treatment. Um, some of this is related to the aging population, but I think quite concerningly, some of this is also related to the overdose crisis that we're experiencing in San Francisco. And you can see that for people living with HIV, deaths from overdoses increased from 10%, and meaning 10% of deaths were due to overdose from 2010 to 2013. And then from 2018 to 2021, deaths from overdoses were 18% of deaths. So this is a major priority for the health department, San Francisco Department of Public Health in our city, as I think many of you know. Here you see trends in new diagnoses in select populations. And while in most populations, HIV diagnoses each year have been going down, including among whites, blacks, people who inject drugs, and people who experience homelessness, new diagnoses in Latinx individuals, and primarily in Latinx MSM, increased over this time period from 2019 to 2022. Again, area of concern and focus for us, and hopefully this is something on your radar as well and as you work with patients and community. Here you see our HIV care continuum from 2018 to 2022. So each bar is represents um, a year during that time frame, and you can see the number of diagnoses on the far left, and then the um, proportion of new diagnoses who were linked to care within one month, and the proportion who were virally suppressed within six months. That's the um, kind of dashed. Thing. And then the number uh, proportion linked within 12 months are the solid bars. So for 2022, um, we don't yet have the um, proportion linked within 12 months because we need more follow-up time for that. But what you see here is good news, which is that 90% of people newly diagnosed with HIV in San Francisco are linked to care within one month after diagnosis. And 
um, we've seen some improvements in the proportion virally suppressed within six months from 75% to 80%. And this is a testament to the system of care we've built in San Francisco where we have access to rapid ART starts and also to our Lynx team. Do we have folks from Lynx in the house? You wanna raise your hand if you're from Lynx? So Lynx, um, who works with newly diagnosed people and assures that they're linked to care promptly. Um, we, in San Francisco overall, among everyone living with HIV, 73% of people are virally suppressed, and this surpasses our, the UN AIDS target for this metric, but not all populations achieve this goal. So you can see here on the bottom, populations who have a lower, um, lower than 73% proportion virally suppressed. So again, these are disparities. This is where we focus our attention in our work. One piece of good news on this slide is that the proportion of people experiencing homelessness who were virally suppressed increased from 20% in 2020 during you know, the COVID pandemic, which really disrupted systems of care and had a disproportionate impact on people experiencing homelessness up to 52% in 2022. So this is, this is, we still have a big way to go here, but I think this improvement is promising. Again, this is thanks to our whole person integrated care system, to a shelter health, to um, links and many others who um, work with, with this population. Moving on to STIs, San Francisco um, does have a very high burden of STIs relative to the rest of the country. We have higher chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis rates compared to all of California and the US, as well as to other large jurisdictions like LA and New York. On the left, you see gonorrhea rates. Again, San Francisco, this is a place where we don't necessarily wanna be the best or the top. Um, and then syphilis rates here on the right. So we, um, we do see a lot of STIs here, and we're glad that you are interested in this subject and, and here to learn and help. A major area of concern in STI epidemiology is the rise in syphilis among women, among females, and the rise in congenital syphilis. And this is not a phenomenon that's unique to San Francisco. Unfortunately, um, it's happening across the country and across California. So on the left here, you see the number of reported, this is national data from the CDC showing <clears throat> numbers of reported cases of syphilis of all stages with the orange bars. And then in the blue bars, um, the number of reported cases of congenital syphilis. And across the US, <clears throat> there was a 141% increase in the number of women reported with um, syphilis from 2017 to 2021 and a 203% increase in the number of congenital syphilis cases. This is a public health emergency. Um, and then on the right here, you see California congenital syphilis cases going back a little farther, back to 2013. And over this time period, 810% um, increase in congenital syphilis cases. And here's our local data for San Francisco. It, um, this, this epidemic and, of syphilis in cis women hit San Francisco a little later than it did the rest of California and the country. Um, and it started like back here and other places. And for us, the steep uptick really started more around 2017, but you can see these numbers are rising and they are continuing to rise. We have had a 251% increase in syphilis among females from 2017 to 2023. And the um, blue line here and these numbers in the boxes are our number of congenital syphilis cases. And last year in 2023, um, we uh, very unfortunately had six congenital syphilis cases. This is the highest number in 30 years in San Francisco. And this is, and I'll talk more about congenital syphilis, but this really is considered a public health, um, a collapse of our public health and safety net system because these cases really should be preventable with a strong safety net, access to care, stigma-free care, et cetera. Um, another major area of focus for us in STIs is young, um, is, is adolescents and young adults. This is a population that has much higher rates of STIs than older population, and it's a place where we see some of the starkest racial and ethnic disparities, I would say in, even in medicine. Um, so there, there has been Overall, um, a decline in chlamydia rates, which is, which is good among adolescents and young adults. But some of this is a little complicated to interpret because 
during the pandemic, healthcare services really um, shut down and healthcare services for youth in particular um, were, there was very low access and they've been a little bit slower to come back. Um, so some of this may be due to less screening happening, but it's, it's kind of hard to tease all of that out. Regardless, what we still see here is vast disparities in rates. And I'm gonna show you one more figure just to highlight this. This shows 2022 chlamydia rates um, that, and their disproportionate impact on black and Latinx females. So here you see different racial ethnic groups and then along the um, Y axis here, age groups. And you can see how disproportionately black African-American young women are affected by chlamydia. So this is another um, area of focus and an area where partnerships with healthcare systems and providers and community are so critical. The last STI epi update I'm gonna give here is on MPOX. Anybody still thinking about MPOX? <laughs> yeah, well, we haven't had very many cases in the last few months, which is good, but San Francisco was very hard hit by the initial MPOX outbreak in the summer of 2022, which kind of peaked in late July, early August. Um, and then we, had, we did have another small uptick in the late fall, sort of third, fourth quarter of 2023. Um, and during from July 1st to December, 2023, we had 87 MPOX cases. So definitely nothing like this big surge when MPOX entered a totally susceptible population with no immunity and no um, vaccine yet. Uh, so this is good, but um, I think it does suggest to us like we may still see small outbreaks in the future and we need to continue to focus on getting folks who may be at risk for MPOX vaccinated. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. So to summarize um, the epi pieces before I move to program updates, uh, what we're seeing here in San Francisco is that our rate of decline in new HIV diagnoses has stalled. And we're really thinking about what can we do to get the innovative tools for HIV prevention and treatment out to folks to kind of push us to our getting to zero goals. And you'll hear more about that um, later in the morning. We do have a high level of rapid linkage to HIV care and viral suppression, but there are disparities that, that persist. And there's some particularly concerning, concerning trends that we're focusing on include the increase in diagnoses among Latinx people, particularly men who have sex with men. The lack of decline, I didn't highlight this in the slides, but we've also seen a st stalling out with trans women. We haven't seen the same progress there. Um, and the ongoing high proportion of new diagnoses and people experiencing homelessness. On the STI side, syphilis rates in cis women and the number of congenital syphilis cases continue to increase. We continue to see STI disparities among adolescents and young adults. And MPOX is not eliminated. So we do need continued vaccine promotion and education for providers and patients. So I'm gonna shift now to program updates and talk about what do we do as, in the health department and in the population health division in particular um, to address these trends and to try to support sexual health and support community. So our mission here is in, in our um, program is to provide information, services, and policies that prevent STIs and HIV, that promote sexual and reproductive health, and that enable all people in San Francisco to have safe, healthy sexual lives. You can see that we have a number of different focus areas here to help us achieve um, these goals. And part of our framework is to address disparities through an integrated, syndemic, patient-centered approach. The California Department of Public Health about a year ago now, or two years ago, released this um, integrated implementation blueprint, which is a statewide strategic plan for addressing HIV, hepatitis C, and STIs. And it focuses on these um, six domains, which are big drivers of this syndemic, which is syndemic is when you have multiple infections that are affecting the same population and that kind of, um, it, they can inc each increase the risk of the other and they can increase the risk of bad outcomes from the other as well. And they have similar upstream drivers. So some of the principles to this approach include centering, advancing and prioritizing health equity and racial justice, integration, like I talked about, 
employee and status neutral care, which means we're here to serve everyone who walks in the door, not just people who are living with HIV or people who are not living with HIV. This is about the person and not about what infection they may or may not come in the door with. We try to make our services low barrier, value lived experience, focusing on anti-stigma um, approaches, using a harm reduction framework, addressing social determinants where we can. Um, and I think very importantly, and this is part of the reasons we're so thrilled to have all of you in the room and online is that we need to do this through collective impact. It takes um, a village to do this work. I'm gonna highlight a few of our um, programs now in the last part of my talk that are essential to this work. And one is an innovative new model that our community health equity promotion branch at SFDPH is leading, which is to set up a network of health access points or HAPs. The HAPs um, launched in July of 2023. So they're still in their early um, stages of rolling out. And the goal with the HAPs is again, to provide this low barrier network um, of, of services and reduce disparities by addressing vulnerabilities through focused community investment. And I'll tell you a little more about where the HAPs are. Um, they're all um, run by different organizations with a different population focus. And the idea is that they're able to offer all of these wraparound services to people coming in the door. And these are our seven HAPs. Again, they have a population focus, but anyone can receive services at any of our seven HAPs. Um, and we have uh, a Latinx HAP led by Instituto Familio de la Raza and Mission Neighborhood Health Center. We have a HAP focused for trans women led by the San Francisco Community Health Center a HAP for people who use drugs and people who experience homelessness that's led by Ward 86 here at ZSFG and is in a new space in building 80 right around the corner. Um, we have a HAP for gay, bi, and other MSM led by the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, Asian Pacific Islander HAP led by UCSF Alliance Health Project, a HAP for young adults led by Lyric, um, and a HAP focused for Black African Americans led by Rafiki Coalition in partnership with um, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, Third Street Youth Center and Positive Resource Center. So we're very excited to try to support these um, important um, organizations and getting these additional services added to the work that many of them are already doing um, and expand access to care. Another major focus of our program, given what I shared with you about um, the EPI is the prevention of congenital syphilis. So I think many of you are aware that um, syphilis during pregnancy can really result in devastating outcomes for the fetus, including um, stillbirth, neonatal death, blindness, deafness, developmental delay, and skeletal abnormalities. And the um, pregnant people who are acquiring syphilis and not getting diagnosed and treated early in pregnancy are experiencing intersectional high vulnerability. There's higher rates of substance use, homelessness, and lack of prenatal care in this population. Um, we are doing a number of things to try to address this, um, this problem, this public health problem. And one is that we're really trying to promote CDPHs, the California Department of Public Health's new expanded syphilis screening recommendations. So previously, you know, we had said, most women don't, don't need to be screened for, for syphilis. We would screen pregnant people once or twice during pregnancy, and that was the main focus. But now we are recommending annual integrated, so HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia screening in people who can become pregnant if they have risk factors for these infections. And you can see some of the key ones listed here. Um, having sex with a man who has sex with men, history of STI in the past year, substance use, unstable housing, sex work, intimate partner violence, history of incarceration. And we're working with high prevalence settings like jails, urgent care, and emergency rooms to try to increase this sort of opportunistic screening when people do um, interact with our system of care. And in addition, not shown here on this slide, part of these new recommendations is at least one lifetime opt-out syphilis screen in all sexually active people, men and women. So that's a big change for providers. And we're, um, we've been working to put um, 
prompts in the EPIC electronic health record to remind providers to screen. Um, and so hopefully all of you will also have like a low, lower barrier to try to um, screen your patients for syphilis. A lot of our CS prevention work is led again through collective impact through a task force that's led by Allison Decker and from our program and Liliana Osagueda from Maternal Child and Adolescent Health and has partnership and participation from many people across our system of care from um, whole person integrated care, from urgent care, ER, Team Lily, MCAH, many people working together to try to address this crisis with the goal really being to have people diagnosed and treated before they become pregnant. If they acquire syphilis during pregnancy, have them diagnosed early so they can be treated and the baby can um, have, be, have an averted case. Um, and we're doing a number of different things. I mentioned electronic health record tools. This is a screenshot here of something that the team worked to build where we can put in a loss to follow-up banner in EPIC. So for those of you who work in the SFDPH's EPIC, please look for these on the left panel of the EHR. Um, we also have, as I said, care gaps and prompts to remind providers when people need syphilis screening. And the team right now is working on a um, pilot to get lower barrier access to pregnancy testing, particularly for people experiencing homelessness. So if you're interested in getting involved in this work, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and moving on to youth, where I talked about the um, disparities that we see, this is another important area of focus where we work in collaboration with providers and CBOs. Um, in San Francisco, we've launched a home testing program that's geared towards young women of color called Don't Think No. So people can go online and order a free test kit. Feel free to promote this through your networks with your patients. We um, historically have had a team led through our community health equity and promotion branch called our youth team, Youth United Through Health Education, that works with young people in the community who come in as interns, get um, professional development skills, learn about sexual health, and go back and work and do workshops in their schools and in their communities. Last year, our youth participated in a really um, creative youth storytelling project. These videos are all online on our website, and I encourage you to take a look. For MPOX prevention, we continue to um, promote MPOX prevention through public service announcements and social media and through community-based vaccine pop-up events. I think the community demand for vaccine is kind of waning right now as it fades from everyone's attention. So please do continue to remember to offer MPOX vaccine to your patients. We're gonna be doing another um, social media push in the next few months before uh, pride season and summer. One of our other roles in this STD update is an example of that is to educate, educate providers about sexual health through consultation, training, and capacity building. We produce a lot of different educational materials. There's a number, for those of you who are here in person, there's a lot on the back table in the room. And we have also built an e-consult in Epic, again, for those of you who are SFDPH Epic users, so you can consult, um, you, you look up sexually transmitted infection or San Francisco City clinic and you'll find our e-consult. Most of our resources are available on our website, so you can look there for them. Another critical thing that we do in our um, STI program, a core public health function, is to link individuals with HIV and STIs to prevention, treatment, and care. And that includes um, providing support with partner notification for people with an STI. And we do that through our links team. So one more shout out to our linkage integration navigation comprehensive services team um, who does incredible work and I, has to build a huge array of skills to successfully do this complex work. And I won't go through all the numbers for the sake of time, but you can see here um, the volume of patients that they work with year after year and the success that they have in getting people treated, getting partners treated, linking people and providing the services in such a um, compassionate and um, stigma-free way. 
Another core part of our program is our clinic. So one of our roles is to ensure access to sexual health. We can't do this alone, of course. We need all providers and primary care and urgent cares to also be able to do this, but we do have a fortunate to have a health department run sexual health clinic in San Francisco. Um, we offer a range of services. We have expanded over the last few years and or changed, I should say, evolved. Um, we're now on Epic, um, which was a big change for us. We've moved to having both drop-in and appointments available. We have nurse-led and navigator-led express visits, and we have a very robust biomedical prevention program at the clinic. I'm going to um, move now to, for the sake of time, to talk a little bit about doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis, doxypep. Who in the room has heard of doxypep? Excellent. Almost everyone. So we're, we're very excited to have a new effective biomedical prevention tool for STIs. Um, there have been now a number of randomized controlled trials that show that taking doxycycline within 24 to 72 hours after um, condomless sex can significantly reduce the risk of bacterial STIs in MSM and trans women. Um, and this is a figure from the DoxyPet study, City Clinic was the site in that study. Um, and we um, you know, chose Doxy for this because it's inexpensive, we know that it's safe, um, it's rapidly absorbed. So we, San Francisco was the first health department in the nation to release DoxyPEF guidelines um, in uh, late October, 2022. And we recommend that DoxyPEF be offered as part of an overall comprehensive package of sexual health services. So DoxyPEF is not the only thing we do, right? We wanna do all of these things. We wanna do primary prevention, vaccines, HIV, PEP, PrEP, and linkage to care secondary prevention, addressing social determinants of health and policy. But as part of this package, DoxyPEP really has the potential to, um, to, to help us turn the curve on these rising rates of STIs. So we've done some work over the last few months to try to evaluate what has been happening in San Francisco since we issued that DoxyPEP guidance. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of data on this, and then you're gonna hear more about the clinical part of DoxyPEP later this morning from, Docs, from Dr. Bacon. So what we've done in San Francisco is we first tried to say, well, how many people are using DoxyPEP since we issued the guidelines? And our Getting to Zero Consortium has helped coordinate this surveillance effort. And right now we're just looking at number of people started on DoxyPEP at City Clinic, at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation's Magnet Clinic, and at Ward 86. And clearly there's many other providers and clinics in San Francisco who are doing this. So this is an underestimate, but it's helping us get a sense of the trajectory of doxypep uptake and also look at disparities. So you can see that from October, 2022 to December, 2023, 3,779 people were prescribed doxypep across those three clinics. As I mentioned, we're also doing this to track disparities. This figure shows at each of the three clinics, Sexual Health Clinic 1, Sexual Health Clinic 2, and Ward 86, um, the proportion of individuals of MSM and trans women who had at least one visit at the clinic by race, ethnicity, and the proportion who chose to start DoxyPEP. So we see here that interestingly, uptake is quite a bit lower in the HIV care clinic setting than in the sexual health clinic mm -hmm. settings. And overall, there's pretty similar uptake across racial ethnic groups, but there's some signs of possible disparities that we we're, want to track and try to address. Um, Latinx individuals, that's the gray bar here, had higher than the average uptake at all three of these sites. Black African Americans in this orange bar had a little bit lower than the average uptake. So not as bad as the disparities we see nationwide with PrEP uptake, but still um, a trend that we wanna follow. And then my last two um, slides here, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions. What is happening with STIs after all these people have started using doxypep? That's really what everyone wants to know. So um, Dr. Hyman Scott, who many of you may know, he's the medical director at the Magnet Clinic, and Dr. Oliver Bacon, who's the medical director at SF City Clinic, both um, did some analyses that were presented at this year's Cori conference a few weeks ago looking at how did STI positivity change 
in our PrEP patients after we started offering doxypep. And you can see here that chlamydia decreased by 67% and 90% in the PrEP um, patients and syphilis decreased by 78% and 56%. So really good news here after year upon year of increasing STIs. Interestingly, gonorrhea, which was effectively prevented by doxypep in the randomized control trials, did not seem to have, has not had a decrease in these PrEP cohorts. And then lastly, it's like, okay, that's what's happening in clinic-based cohorts. What's happening citywide? So um, one of our STI epidemiologists, Maddie Sankaran, in collaboration with the team, looked at how are citywide um, case counts in men who have sex with men and trans women changing after we issue doxypep guidelines. So this gray dashed line is when the doxypep guidelines were released. And the um, black line here is the number of cases of chlamydia on the left and syphilis on the right. And the, the orange line here is the trend before guidelines were released. The blue dashed line is the predicted trend if nothing had happened. This is done through um, a modeling approach called an interrupted time series. And then the green dashed line is what did we actually observe? And you can just see visually here, there is like a big difference between what we observed and what we would have expected to observe without something happening. So for chlamydia, by November, 2023, citywide case counts were 50% lower than modeled forecast and syphilis cases were 51% lower. So this is um, really striking, striking findings. And it's still early. We need to follow these trends out for longer. Um, and I think there's still you know, potential unknowns here, but this is highly encouraging for us to see with um, this initial phase of doxypep rollout. So in conclusion, social determinants, including homelessness, stigma, institutionalized racism, and their downstream effects are continuing to drive these syndemics, HIV, STIs, and hepatitis C as well. Um, we try to use in the health department data-informed programming to address inequities, and we're implementing this syndemic approach um, with an equity-focused low barrier access. We do have these new tools and we're very excited about our new tools in HIV and STI prevention and treatment. I didn't have a chance to talk a lot about long acting injectables, but Dr. Bacon will talk about this um, later this morning. But we need a lot of work to ensure equitable access to these new innovative tools so that we don't see a worsening of the disparities that already exist. In our partnerships with health systems, providers, community-based organizations, and our newly launched health access points, are very core um, elements of our response. So there's um, so many people who are involved in this work and I, I'm, I'm sure this list is not entirely comprehensive, but I mostly wanna shout out all the staff at SF City Clinic and in our STI program and our amazing patients. And again, thank all of you for coming this morning. Oh. That was a great round of applause for Dr. Stephanie Cohen, and we have time for questions. So we're going to have Allison take the first two questions from the virtual audience, and then we'll take questions in the room. The first question from the audience is, um, can anyone order test kits through the Youth Don't Think No program that you were describing, and even patients living outside of San Francisco? This provider uh, lives in San Mateo. Great. Thank you for the question. Um, so I'm really glad that that question was asked because I didn't have a chance to also mention our other home testing program. We actually have two home testing programs. One is called Don't Think No, and the other one is called Take Me Home. And um, Take Me Home is a little more geared towards men who have sex with men, although anyone can actually use either program. Although Take Me Home, you need to have a vagina because the kit is a vaginal swab. So other people are not going to benefit from Take Me Home. I mean, from Don't Think No. Take Me Home, you can get a um, dried blood spot for HIV and syphilis testing, as well as three site screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia, so rectal, throat, and urine. Both programs, you do have to be a San Francisco resident, um, but there is Take Me Home access throughout the state, so I would encourage that provider to check out takemehome.org and see. Um, they, San Mateo residents might be able to use Take Me Home. You have another question from the online audience, and then I'm going to 
Okay, so two related questions. And I'm sorry, also don't think no is also available in many counties throughout the state, not just San Francisco. I don't know if San Mateo's on Take Me Home. I don't know if anyone else does, but go ahead. These are both related to doxypep. One, are there any issues with patients taking doxypep multiple times and developing resistance? And why gonorrhea rates did not decline in doxypep in the clinical setting compared with study findings? Are there concerns about doxypep contributing to gonorrhea's antimicrobial resistance? Okay, so great. The two or three, $3 million doxypep <laughs> questions are already on the table. Yes. And I'll do my best. I think I only have like two minutes. Yeah. And Oliver, Dr. Bacon's going to talk about doxypep yeah. too. So let me see what I can do quickly for those. So gonorrhea, why didn't gonorrhea go down? And I, sorry, I didn't say this explicitly, but in the citywide analyses, gonor gonorrhea rates also did not go down. So in the clinic-based cohorts and at a citywide level, gonorrhea is not changing. Why? Um, in the RC randomized control trials, doxypep wasn't quite as effective against gonorrhea than compared to chlamydia and syphilis. It's possible that we may need higher levels of adherence to prevent gonorrhea. And it's also possible that the proportion of gonorrhea in the community that's resistant to doxy is changing. Already at baseline, about 25% of gonorrhea isolates are resistant to doxy. So I don't think there was really ever an expectation that doxypep was gonna be the solution for gonorrhea. We really need other tools for gonorrhea, including vaccines. Do you want me to skip take... the AMR question? And then or... we'll, and Oliver, <laughs> you're going to talk AMR about it, right? Question. Okay, so we're going to talk about antimicrobial we resistance. We'll make sure we address <clears throat> antimicrobial yeah. resistance and doxypep before the end of the morning. We promise. So um, I'm going to take a question in the room. Sorry, let me run over to you. And this is so our virtual audience can hear. So my, my question is with the doxypep, <laughs> have you uh, been able to sort your data to see how many um, people youth were actually offered and used doxypep and the, the actual change in these infections in the youth population? Thank you, Annalise, great question. Um, I Not yet, I think is what I would say. For the getting to zero sentinel surveillance of doxypep, we do have a similar set of data showing uptake by age. But the lowest age range I think we've looked at so far is 18. I don't think we've um, worked yet with the CHIPI clinics to think about a strategy for offering doxypep for younger folks. But at this point in time, doxypep is not broadly recommended for cis women because of the one randomized control trial, and Dr. Bacon will talk more about this, that looked at doxypep in women did not show that it was effective. So that is, I think, our the big problem with doxypep is that a population in whom we desperately need new tools for STI prevention, including young women, women across um, the lifespan, we haven't, we don't have that data yet. So yeah, that's where we are. And also for M MSWs, really, this has only been shown to be effective in men who have sex with men, trans women at this point in time. So yeah. The hook is coming out. Okay. okay. Now it's time for Kelly Johnson. She is the medical director of the California Prevention Training Center, a public health medical officer in the STD control branch at CDPH, and an assistant professor in the division of ID here at UCSF. And uh, her research interests include the intersection between HIV and bacterial STIs and real world implement implementation of PrEP. And I am proud to count her as one of my mentees and um, she's just gonna take over the whole world and I'm very excited about it. So, um, and here she goes. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Ina, for that introduction. I'm definitely not going to live up to those expectations, but I'm going to try to give you a really good talk today. <laughs> Before I get started, I want to see if I move my pointer. You all can see this in the room, obviously. Does that work online? That does not work online. OK, I'm sorry about that. OK, I'll try one more time. Yes. Oh, it does work online. Wonderful. Okay. I just want to see if folks in the room and online can both see what I'm doing since there's going to be a lot of pictures in this talk. Okay. So learning objectives for this piece of the talk, we're going to be developing a differential diagnosis of STIs that commonly cause genital ulceration. So things like HSV, primary syphilis, and MPOX, which we heard a little bit about. I'm going to hope that by the end of this session, you'll be able to list some distinguishing features of STIs that cause genital ulcerations, but also know that there's quite a bit of overlap between some of these diagnoses in terms of how they present. 
And then I'm hoping to help you recognize some of those extra genital dermatologic manifestations of STIs. Okay, so we're gonna do a case. Let's say you have a 35 year old bisexual man coming into your clinic with genital ulcers. The ulcers are a little bit painful. They're not pruritic. There are a bunch of them. Here's his physical exam. It looks like this. So you can see there are several sort of shallow erythematous ulcers. There's a little bit of exudate maybe on this part here. And I'm gonna ask you what you think this is. So we're gonna do this two ways. I'm gonna ask for Lauren and Elizabeth to go ahead and launch the poll for the online audience. And then for folks in the room, we're gonna try old school. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. So if you think this is genital herpes, hands up. Okay, we only have four votes for herpes. That is surprising. All right, how about if you think it's primary syphilis? More votes, okay. So, oh, that was maybe like six or seven folks. All right, what, how about MPOX? Could this be MPOX? Anyone in the room? All right, Stephanie gave a little like maybe, okay. <laughs> how about LGV, lymphogranuloma venereum? Okay, big hand up. One person does think that. Okay, how about granuloma inguinale? Nobody, that's fair. I wouldn't have thought that either. And how about the poll, the Zoom folks? What are we seeing, Allison? 42% um, think that it is primary syphilis, followed by 27% genital herpes, and then MPOX, chancroid, and LGD. Awesome. So the correct answer, you guys are right. It was primary syphilis, but actually I presented this case before and people always think it's herpes. And honestly, I probably would have thought it's herpes too. It looks like herpes, um, but it was primary syphilis. So you all are on top of this, but the truth is any of the things on this list here can cause genital ulceration. And that's kind of the point today to look at where there's similarities and differences between these causes of genital ulcerative disease. So let's go through the differential diagnosis. Now, since this patient had syphilis, I'm going to start with syphilis. As you all know, syphilis is caused by a bacterium. It's a spirochete. It's called treponema pallidum, and it causes a really interesting infection. And the reason it's interesting is that it's because it causes these episodes and stages of active disease where a patient will have symptoms signs of their infection, but it's interspersed by these other periods where the patient's totally asymptomatic and they won't know that they have their infection and you won't know either unless you screen them. The arrows down at the bottom of the slide are meant to point out that serious complications, including neuro and ocular syphilis, as well as very importantly, transmission from a pregnant person to a child can actually occur at any phase of syphilitic infection. But we're gonna start on the left-hand side with primary syphilis. So after a person is exposed to syphilis, there's an incubation period. The average is about three to four weeks, but it can be up to 90 days. After which point the patient will develop symptoms of what's known as primary syphilis, the initial stage, the initial active stage of infection. Primary syphilis is characterized as you probably all know by a chancre or an ulcer. And classically, this is a single painless indurated lesion that occurs at the site of exposure. It can have these sort of rolled, raised, rubbery edges, and it can go unrecognized, particularly if it's in spaces like the vagina or the rectum where the patient might not be looking and the clinician may not be looking either, depending on what a patient's coming in to be seen for. So let's look at primary syphilis. These are some of those typical chancres. You can see them on the slide here. So these are sort of well demarcated lesions. You can see there's just one of them on the slide here. They might have these sort of raised kind of rubbery edges. And again, classically, they're gonna be single and they're gonna be painless. But syphilis has been called the great masquerader for a reason. And as you all sort of knew, I was trying to trick you. These are also syphilitic shankers, but really atypical presentations. So here was our patient. Here are some perirectal lesions. Here are some penile lesions that I think look, again, quite a bit like herpes. And then this is a pretty atypical looking lesion from City Clinic of a, of a person with female anatomy and several different shankers. And these might be a little bit painful. So don't be tripped up if that happens to you uh, for a patient in clinic that you're seeing. The main point is that if you see something like this, just test for both. It's hard to tell the difference. So swab for herpes, send a herpes PCR, and also be thinking about and testing for primary syphilis. Another thing that's interesting about primary syphilis is that these chancres that I mentioned, they do occur at any sites of inoculation, and that can include extra genital spaces. So here's a lesion on a tongue. 
lesion on a finger, and then some lesions on the lip as well. Pretty interesting. Now, since I've talked about herpes a little bit, let's take a minute to, to continue our differential diagnosis, our trip through genital ulcerative disease by talking about herpes. Herpes, unlike syphilis, is caused by virus, HSV-1 or HSV-2. It's transmitted primarily by a contact with infectious lesions or secretions um, or, or mucosal surfaces that are affected. Classically, the ulcers of herpes, they are multiple and they're painful and they progress through stages, which I'll talk about, though patients may have several stages at the same time. On the next slide, I'll show you the clinical progression. So herpes lesions often start with just some redness and swelling of the skin. This might even be a little bit itchy or a little bit painful for the patient. After which point, the patient will develop these thin walled fluid filled vesicles and pustules. It's not shown very well on this slide, but I will show you on the next slide. These vesicles and pustules, they then sort of burst open, resulting in the ulcerations and erosions that you can see with um, herpes. And after that, the skin starts to heal up. You get some early healing followed by some crusting, and I'll show you some other photos of that. Then the lesions scab over and eventually they go away and the person is done with this episode of herpes. This is what I wanted to show you with the ulcerations because I don't think it showed up very well in that clinical progression slide, but I think here on this vulvar surface, you can see this more eroded looking skin and that's the same over here. These look uh, like an erosion or an ulceration becoming pretty confluent here for this person. And then this middle picture, it's interesting. It's of a cervix, obviously. And I think this is my best picture of a crop of vesicles on an erythematous base, which is sort of like a buzzword. If you're somebody who takes any board exams, crop of vesicles on an erythematous base, be thinking of herpes. And uh, here's a good example. Here are herpes lesions on a penis. Again, crop of lesions here in the middle. Over here, you can see um, some of that erosion starting to happen. So these vesicles have burst open and this person does have erosion or ulceration of the skin here. And on this side, you can see crusting. So these lesions have started to kind of crust and they'll scab over and eventually, again, they will go away. This is a really interesting picture that a colleague of mine from UW shared with us. This is a herpetic lesion inside this person's urethra. And you can imagine that that would be, I know I'm seeing some faces in the room and probably online too. You can imagine that this would be really, really painful for this person if they had to go to the bathroom or anything like that. So that's herpes. Just rounding out the differential, I'm gonna talk about a few other clinical entities, less common causes of genital ulceration that we see here um, in the United States, but I'll talk about them anyways, just so you have them in your mind. So on this slide, you see lymphogranuloma venereum or LGB. This is caused by chlamydia trachomatis. It's caused by specific serovars, so L1, L2, and L3. I've never seen this, to be honest with you, but LGV apparently can cause an ulcer, which is self-limited, evanescent. It might may be either an ulcer or a papule. This is a published image, and you can see this is fairly subtle. But I think what you'll see more commonly are the next two bullet points. So patients may develop pretty extensive lymphadenopathy. It's usually a tender inguinal or femoral lymphadenopathy, often just on one side. The lymph nodes might be fluctuant. They may be separative or pussy. And so I think that's, some, I'll show you another slide of that as well coming up, but that would be something to be thinking about with LGV. And then similarly for the next bullet point, I know this is something that City Clinic deals with a lot, but oftentimes patients with LGV will present with non-GU symptoms, more along the lines of proctitis or proctocolitis. Here's something called the groove sign, also a buzzword for folks who take board exams. The groove sign can happen with LGV. Why does this happen? It's actually just this person has such inflamed and enlarged inguinal lymph nodes here, and they're transected by the inguinal ligament going right through them. And that's why you get this groove um, that is classically associated with LGV. Even less common would be chancroid caused by Haemophilus ducreae. This is seen mostly overseas in Africa and the Caribbean. These ulcers are multiple, they're deeper, they're very painful, and they may, they may be exudative. 
they can be associated with lymphadenopathy as well. But I think pain is the main thing to remember. I think you learned classically in your training that H. Ducre E, which is the causative pathogen here, um, it is something that you do cry with. It does cause pain. You will be in pain if you have this. And because of that, non-GU symptoms are actually pretty unusual because patients are gonna seek care for their painful lesions. In the United States, this is really a diagnosis of exclusion. So if it's not herpes, it's not primary syphilis, it's not MPOX, it's really painful. Be thinking about chancroid. The last one is granuloma inguinale caused by a bacteria, Klebsiella granulomatis. Really uncommon in this country, pretty rare. There are sporadic cases elsewhere, as you can see up on the slide. I've never seen a case of this, to be honest with you, and I've actually polled a number of my colleagues recently and they've never seen a case either, but it's kind of an interesting lesion because it's slowly progressive. It's really tissue destructive. It's really red, it's really vascular, it can bleed. But the thing is it's said to be classically relatively painless, which has always been quite surprising to me because it looks like that would hurt, but apparently it does not. So if your patient comes in and they look like that, but they say, it doesn't feel like anything, maybe be thinking about granuloma inguinale. Let's get back to our case. So after examining the patient's genital ulcers, the provider suspects genital herpes. We apparently in the room did not suspect this as our primary diagnosis, but almost always this is kind of where we were thinking as an audience too at this point in the case. But anyways, the clinician doesn't test for, for syphilis. He's thinking herpes, excuse me, prescribes the acyclovir. The ulcers resolve entirely and the patient feels totally well. But he comes back a few weeks later, this time with a diffuse but subtle non-peritic rash. I'll show you on the next slide. So here's the rash, diffuse, subtle, maculopapular, doesn't hurt him, doesn't itch. You can go ahead and launch the poll for the folks online and in the room. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Is this secondary syphilis? Hands up. Yeah, okay. All right, is it, I'm gonna just go through, you know, because I think if you didn't have the history that we have, you really might be reasonably thinking about some of these other diagnoses, but let's see, is this tinea versicolor, anyone? Anyone like malassezia furfur? No. Is it Coxsackie virus? Is it atopic dermatitis? Is it contact dermatitis? No one voting for that. Everyone likes in the room, secondary syphilis. And Allison, how about online? Um, 96% secondary syphilis. 96% secondary syphilis. Well, I gave you two big hints by telling you what was up with the patient originally, and also you're at an STI update. So <laughs> good job. Um, but let's talk about secondary syphilis. That was the answer, of course. So back to our natural history slide, what happens with, with um, syphilis is that that ulcer or chancre of primary syphilis that we talked about, it actually goes away on its own, even without treatment. Then the patient may be asymptomatic for several weeks, and then they may come back and they'll have this constellation of symptoms. And again, I think if you don't have that history that, oh, this person had an ulcer and it got better and it just went away. If you don't have that history and you're just seeing a person with a rash that looks like the rash you saw, totally easy to be thinking about other things. I've seen this be considered a drug rash, atopic dermatitis, contact dermatitis. I've seen it treated with steroids, that sort of thing. So, so that doesn't happen to us. Let's talk about all the things that can show up with secondary syphilis. The primary manifestation is a rash that happens in up to 90% of patients and can involve the palms and the soles. But patients may also have more sort of nonspecific constitutional symptoms. They may have generalized lymphadenopathy. They might sort of have a flu-like kind of illness, or they may have some of these other manifestations, which I'll talk about, but things like mucus patches or condylomalata, which are specific types of really infectious lesions. They may also have a patchy alopecia or little spots of hair loss, and they may have a sort of subclinical hepatitis as well. It's not on the slide, but I'm just adding it in. Um, and uh, with that subclinical hepatitis, often it's uh, the ALKFOS that's elevated a bit out of proportion to the other LFTs. But here's the rash again. This is sort of the classic diffuse appearance. Here's what it looks like on the palms and the soles. I think this image over here, probably the most sort of stereotypical or classic image that I have of palmar and sole lesions with secondary syphilis. 
But not all folks are going to present with that many lesions. Folks may just have one or two or three of these lesions. So be thinking about it if you see any of these sort of macular lesions um, on the hands and feet. Can be syphilis. Can also look kind of strange. So over here on the left-hand side, this is syphilis as well. But these lesions on the hands and feet, they look old. They look like they're scarred down. I could see people thinking like, I don't know, maybe you had an injury 20 years ago, whatever. Um, but this is syphilis. So keep it in mind, even if you see some of these atypical appearing rashes, I would say that's also true for this scrotal lesions here. This is secondary syphilis, but it's not that classic appearance that you might be thinking of. Now I mentioned that syphilis has a lot of mimickers. This is one of them. This patient did not have syphilis. I saw them in the hospital as an ID doctor. They were allergic to vancomycin. So that's what was going on here, but it looks really similar. And I'm just saying that again, to drive home the point that if you're not thinking about syphilis, it's actually very easy to miss. Here's some additional manifestations that can occur with secondary syphilis. These are some of those pathognomonic sort of lesions that I wanted to talk to you all about. So with mucus patches, you get these sort of white plaques in the mucosal surfaces, often in the mouth. So here on the tongue, here on the lips, and these are just white plaques. And again, if you don't know that this is something that can happen with syphilis, you might be like, I don't know what that is. In fact, here are some other things that might be on your differential diagnosis. So this slide shows oropharyngeal candidiasis or thrush also causes this. This one looks sort of yellowish, but it can also cause a whitish yellowish um, collection in the mouth. Classically, the difference is with this lesion with thrush, if you were to take a tongue depressor and you, were try to, you would try to scrape this off, it would come off if it was thrush. And that would not be the case if it was a mucus patch from secondary syphilis. This is also an interesting white plaque in the mouth. This is actually oral hairy leukoplakia, which is a mucosal disease associated with Epstein-Barr virus, often seen in advanced HIV. I think what is seen really well on this lesion here on the slide is that with oral hairy leukoplakia, patients may have to stick out their tongue and direct it to one side in order to see these lesions. They often happen on the lateral tongue. I don't think you see it that well here, but the other thing you'll read about oral hairy leukoplakia is that it can cause these like vertical lines within it. So that's another potential tip off. But I would say again, if you see a white plaque in the mouth, definitely do not rule out the fact that it could be secondary syphilis. This is also secondary syphilis. This is patchy alopecia, just hair loss. This looks just like alopecia areata, regular hair loss. There's no way you would know that this is syphilis unless it's on your differential for things that cause alopecia. These are those lesions I was telling you about called condyloma lata. This is also secondary syphilis. This is a term for large raised whitish or gray lesions that are often found in warm, moist areas like the perianal area or the peri um, vulvar area. And these lesions like mucus patches are actually very infectious. But of course, if you were just seeing this in a vacuum, this could really easily be confused with anogenital warts. So if you see something that you think is an anogenital wart, also be thinking about secondary syphilis and condyloma lata. Just so you have it in your mind, this is a really extreme example, but this is a condyloma cuminata. This is a wart, HPV associated. And you can kind of see this has a much more irregular or cauliflower-like appearance. Whereas these guys that we saw before are a little bit flatter, a little bit less irregular. So if you're looking for distinguishing features that might help you out. But again, just be thinking about secondary syphilis if you think you see an anogenital wart. So the end of the case. Happily, the provider now recognizes the patient's rash as concerning for secondary syphilis and sends syphilis serologies. Both an RPR and a treponemal test are reactive. Patient's diagnosed with syphilis, he's treated appropriately. He gets bicillin times one as an intramuscular injection. His symptoms resolve and he feels well. I am not gonna cover this in any detail because I know we're covering this elsewhere in today's session and because I think most of y'all are aware of this, but just so you've heard it somewhere, syphilis is diagnosed primarily by blood tests and you need two types to make an initial diagnosis, a non-treponemal test like an RPR and a treponemal test like a TPPA. You need both of them for a new diagnosis. And the treatment of choice is penicillin when, when and if it's Syphilis, and the dosing varies by stage, but for both primary and secondary syphilis, the treatment's the same, 2.4 million units of bicillin times one. Let's do another case. So now you have a 25-year-old MSM. He has well-controlled HIV. 
He's coming into clinic with painless genital ulcers that have been there for two or three days. He doesn't have any dysuria and he doesn't have any discharge. He does have condomless oral and anal sex. And here's his genital exam. So you can see these ulcers right at the corona of the penis here, circular, atypical looking, maybe a little bit of a serous exudate there. What is the diagnosis? So I'm gonna ask for the online folks to please vote in the poll. What do you think this is? And in the room, what do we think it is? So do you think this is genital herpes? Hands up. Okay, person's voting, that's great. It's gonna be really embarrassing for me if nobody says anything. So please vote, there's no, there's no penalty if you get it wrong, it's just for learning. But I actually think it really does help with learning if you force yourself to commit to something. Okay, so we had one person <laughs> think this was herpes. Okay, who thinks it's primary syphilis? Yeah, okay, very fair. Who thinks it's MPOX? Okay, a couple of people voting MPOX, just two. How about chancroid? I talked about it, I said it's pretty uncomfortable. Common, but would I throw it in here? Maybe. How about LGB? I talked about that more. Could it be LGB? Okay, I'm seeing some maybes. Okay, all right. Well, people did, so I'd say yes. <laughs> um, all right, how about the online audience, Allison? What do people think? Okay, about half the audience thinks it's primary syphilis. 20% mm -hmm. are thinking genital herpes. Mm -hmm. You did get some people with chancroid. Okay. And okay. then 12% MPOX. Okay. And then a few eight LGB. Yeah, we're all over the place. And the leading differential here, I think, was primary syphilis, which is totally fair. So it's not, it's not, it's not primary syphilis. This was actually MPOX, but very surprising. Yes, and I, 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 our two people who voted MPOX, like, nice job. <laughs> Although one of you did vote multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> So this image was actually sent to me by an STD controller in Orange County. And he told me, I would have bet my retirement that was syphilis. So if you picked syphilis, you're in really good company. I would have thought this was syphilis too. It looks like primary syphilis, but it wasn't. So let's talk about dermatologic manifestations of MPOX. As you all know, there was this big outbreak. 2022 of clade 2B MPOX in countries where it is not endemic, including the United States. Things have tapered off since then, but as Stephanie Cohen pointed out, we're still seeing sporadic cases in California. We're averaging as a state about five cases per week throughout the month of February. So it's still happening. I think it's still good to be aware of what this diagnosis looks like, because it's not impossible that you will see it. So this is classic MPOX. In classic MPOX, there's an incubation period of about one to two weeks, after which point the person develops a prodrome, flu-like symptoms, kind of like what I was saying can happen with secondary syphilis. Here's some images if you wanna know what flu-like symptoms are, but things like fever, fatigue, muscle aches, et cetera. After that, you'll develop a rash. And the rash is classically expected to progress through these different stages, going from macules all the way to scabs. I'm gonna show you some slides of those images. And classically, the rash would present in a particular way. So it would start in the tongue and the mouth, it would go to the face, then it would go to the arms and the legs, then the hands and the feet. I'm saying classically because MPOX existed before 2022, primarily in West and Central Africa. And this is sort of what MPOX looked like when described in the literature at that time. In 2022 and ongoing, we've seen sort of a different variety of MPOX where patients may present like this, but they may present differently. So they might get a prodrome, but the prodrome might happen after they already have the rash, or they may never have a prodrome at all. And the rash may do what it's supposed to and progress through these stages and go from the head to the extremities. But we've also seen a number of cases where that does not happen and the lesions are instead isolated to the anogenital area because if I didn't already say this, I should have, in 2022 and beyond, what we're seeing is primarily sexual transmission, direct contact with these lesions as the mode of spread. So let's look at the rash progression with MPOX. So you'll start with a macule, and just as a derm refresher, I think all we need to know in this room today is that a macule is a flat lesion. Then it progresses to a papule, a raised lesion, so you could feel it if you ran your hand over these lesions. Then a vesicle, a fluid-filled lesion, like what we saw with herpes, followed by a pustule, a pus-filled lesion, and finally, like herpes, a scab that eventually falls off. I think what you're starting to see here, and I'll show it, um, I think, better on some other slides, but MPOX 
classically is described as being a deep-seated, well-circumscribed lesion. It's firm, you can feel it, and it has what's called central umbilication, a little central dot. I know it's hard to see on this slide. I'm gonna show you more. You can kind of start to see it on the finger and you can see it with the scab. There's a central dot associated with these lesions. Happily, most people with MPOX actually get better sort of on their own, just with supportive care. People generally do okay, but we have seen some cases that are really severe and even some ICU admissions and some deaths with MPOX. Again, more common in people with advanced HIV, but in terms of skin manifestations, these severe illnesses can present with necrotizing infections or sort of bacterial super infection on top of MPOX lesions. And this has, for some patients, required pretty morbid sequelae, so needing things like amputations and repeat debridements and things like that. In terms of oropharyngeal lesions, which can happen with MPOX, we've also seen some pretty severe cases there too, where patients are, have so many lesions that they actually can't swallow, they may get dehydrated, they may, may need to be hospitalized just to be able to keep up with their fluid intake. Okay, back to skin. So let's look at MPOX, typical genital lesions. These are sort of the typical appearance. So like I was saying, you can imagine, you could feel these, they're deep seated, they're firm, they have the central umbilication. And you can start to see, I think best on this image here, that they're, they develop that scab and this person will be closer to being towards the tail end of their infection. Now, like secondary syphilis, MPOX skin lesions can involve the palms and the soles. So be thinking about it. Here are these lesions again with that central umbilication. Here's one on the face. And I think on the face, especially here in somebody's beard, that's a place where this could be a confusing diagnosis. This could be a pimple. This could be just a place where this person, you know, scratched himself with a razor and now he's getting a scab. So just wanted to show you that image to have it in mind of places that MPOX can go, which basically is anywhere. So these are sort of the more classic lesions, but let's look at some of these less typical genital lesions. So this is the one from our case from Orange County, very strange looking. This one too, also strange looking. And this one, I've never seen anything like it to be honest with you. But all I'm saying is if you see a lesion, especially if it's not herpes, if it's not primary syphilis, be thinking about MPOX. And if you have the resources in your setting, you may even want to test for all of those things at once if you have a person coming in with a genital ulcerative lesion. So herpes, primary syphilis, and MPOX. Here's some more MPOX skin lesions. These are ones that I think are a little tricky. These may resemble acne. This one is a little bit suspicious for something non-acne. It has that little central umbilication. But these ones on this person's back, this looks just like acne to me. And I think, again, you would need to sort of know the person's sexual history, be thinking about MPOX. Don't forget about it. This was also MPOX. These are really severe lesions. And the thing about this lesion is this patient was really itchy, not painful, just really itchy. And I think if I would have been the person seeing this patient with this rash saying it was itchy, I honestly might've been thinking about something like scabies, like it's a little bit worse down here, maybe at the belt line, but it's not, it's MPOX. A tip off might be up here on the forehead. You can start to see there are lesions here and they are developing some of that central umbilication or central scab. Fair warning, the next image is pretty, pretty bad. This is a CDC published case in MMWR. This is a person with really, really severe MPOX. They have developed bacterial super infection on top of their MPOX lesions. And this has become really necrotic and pussy and obviously has been really tissue destructive. So I don't want you to take away from this talk that patients with MPOX look like this. They don't on average, but this is what can happen. So important to be recognizing MPOX. We talked about oral lesions with secondary syphilis and they can also happen with MPOX and they can also look pretty atypical. So that's why I wanted to put these images on this slide. I think this image here is probably the most recognizable. I think those lesions you could imagine, they kind of look like those typical genital lesions that we saw, but this person just has a white plaque in their mouth. So you might be thinking about the same differential we talked through before, thrush, maybe a mucus patch of secondary syphilis, but it was MPOX. And this one over here, I honestly might've been thinking this was something benign, even like geographic tongue or something, but this was actually MPOX. So just to keep that in mind, if you see a white plaque or patch in the mouth, also be considering that MPOX can do this too. 
The next image is also a more severe case. This was shared with me by the wonderful Dr. Oliver Bacon, who you'll hear from later. This was a person with really severe anal lesions and proctitis. And again, proctitis has been a pretty common presentation of MPOX in the 2022 plus outbreak. This person obviously had a very severe case. These lesions became very confluent, became very raised. If I was seeing this in a vacuum, I might've even been thinking about something like psoriasis or this sort of plaque with this appearance. But on the periphery here, I think there's a little bit of a hint that these lesions might be those same lesions that we've been talking about. So MPOX diagnosis and management basics. This is not an MPOX talk. We are not gonna cover most of this, but just so you have an overview, MPOX right now is diagnosed by a swab of lesions, which is sent for PCR. Most patients actually don't need treatment. Most people just sort of get better on their own with supportive care. They may need pain control, they may need help with fluid intake, but not everybody needs antivirals. But if you are gonna give antivirals, the mainstay has been this one called TPOX. It is available via either a clinical trial or an expanded access investigational new drug protocol through the CDC. We don't actually yet have RCT level data for efficacy of this drug, but it has been what's been used when needed for MPOX in the current outbreak. And happily, speaking to that syndemic approach to, to sexual health care, there is a vaccine, as you all know, that can prevent MPOX. It's called Genios. It's two doses, 28 days apart. And I totally agree with what Dr. Cohen was saying, that we really don't have great uptake. In fact, only one in four eligible persons nationally has received the Genios vaccine. So still something, I know it's sort of fallen off the radar. It's not in the news as much anymore, but still something to be thinking about if you do have folks who are coming in with STIs or for sexual health care, that offering the Genios vaccine, still a really good idea. Okay, we are now going to move into clinical case number three. So here you have a 40 year old transgender female who's coming in with macular and pustular lesions on her hands and her feet. She also tells you she's had three days of joint pains and they've been kind of moving around. So initially they affected her left ankle and her foot. Then they went to her left knee and now they're affecting her right knee. She also has condomless sex, oral and anal, both insertive and receptive with male partners. I'll show you her physical exam on the next slide. So this is a little bit more of a subtle rash, but you can see some of these macular lesions here on her foot. You can see some of these more raised pustular lesions on her fingers. I'll just let you think about that for a moment. And then in a second, I am going to ask you some questions. It's actually the same question that I've been asking. So, <laughs> so if you can go ahead and launch the poll, I think this is my last poll. And for folks in the room, what diagnosis do you suspect here? Is this MPOX? I have been talking a lot about MPOX. <laughs> is it herpes? Is it disseminated gonococcal infection? Okay, got some votes for that. All right. How about secondary syphilis? I have been telling you that can do anything. And I did show you lesions on the hands and the feet. Hmm. No takers. Okay. How about Coxsackie virus? I can cause hand, foot, and mouth disease. Okay. I did not fool anybody in the room with this. How about online? What are folks you online saying? You fooled a few people. Oh, great. But you didn't fool everyone. 41% okay. got DGI. 41. Okay. 26% uh, 26 26 think MPOX and 17% secondary syphilis. Okay. I think that's fair. The answer was disseminated gonococcal infection, but I don't think you would get that just because of the lesions themselves. I think you have to put it in context. So this person is also coming in with pain in their joints and it's kind of moving around. So we'll talk about dermatologic manifestations of DGI. We have seen an increase since the summer of 2020 in California in DGI cases. So I'll spend less time on this, but I do want you to be able to recognize it if you see it. The skin manifestations in the literature are pretty variable. All the things you see on the slide, I would say most people have a painless, non-pyritic, not itchy rash, and they may have papules or petechiae or pustules. The most common manifestation of DGI is something called the arthritis dermatitis syndrome pretty much named because it causes arthritis and also dermatitis. <laughs> so patients may have um, like a migratory polyarthralgia is what they call it. But basically like we saw in our case, patients may have joint pains and they may kind of move around the body, which is otherwise sort of strange. And on top of that arthritis, patients will have a dermatitis. 
if you look for published studies, I think this is what you'll see, these sort of petechial lesions, somewhat pustular here, starting to scab over here. I have seen DGI not a ton of times. It's pretty rare, but when I've seen it, it looks a little bit to me more like the images on this slide. I know they're kind of fuzzy, but I put them in here anyways, because when I've seen it, I have seen the lesions to be a little bit more like a reddish purple, mostly flat um, and classically located kind of on the distal extremities. Now DGI causes things other than the arthritis dermatitis syndrome. It can actually cause a variety of manifestations because with DGI, what happens is the bacteria, the gonorrhea, you get the infection at a mucosal site, but then it invades the bloodstream and it can travel anywhere in the body. So patients may present with septic arthritis, they can have meningitis, they can even have endocarditis or osteomyelitis. So a variety of manifestations are possible with DGI. Skin lesions may just be one potential tip off and not everybody has them. When it does cause a septic arthritis, it's typically a mono or oligoarticular septic arthritis, so affecting just one or maybe a couple of joints. It doesn't look any different than any other septic arthritis, though. It'll cause like a red, hot, swollen joint, as you can see in this person here and this person here. But if you were to aspirate this lesion or you were to take this person to the operating room and get cultures, what would happen is gonorrhea. Hopefully, though it's hard to grow, would grow from your operative or aspirate specimen and then you would have your diagnosis. So I won't be talking about this much in detail at all, but in terms of just really basics of diagnosing and treating DGI, the diagnosis is pretty much made it in one of two ways. Either you're gonna culture gonorrhea from a site where it shouldn't be, so maybe that elbow, you're gonna get gonorrhea from it, or maybe the CSF, or maybe the blood, maybe a bone culture. If you get gonorrhea at a disseminated site, you have diagnosed DGI. Or there's this other scenario where you can have a, a nucleic amplification test positive for gonorrhea at a mucosal site, like the rectum or the urogenital tract or the pharynx. And if you have that, in the context of a person who's also saying, I've had fevers and chills, or I've had these joint pains, be thinking about DGI. So you can diagnose DGI just clinically based on positive gonorrhea at a mucosal site plus the right clinical syndrome. Treatment, usually at least for the arthritis dermatitis syndrome, it'll be a third generation cephalosporin for at least seven days. I wouldn't take that to the bank because obviously it depends on the manifestation. So if a person has endocarditis with DGI, don't just treat them for seven days. They'll need longer, at least four weeks, probably six. Okay, this is my last substantive slide. It's a doozy. There's a lot of information on here. <laughs> I don't think uh, we need to go over all of this in detail, but I'll do it pretty briefly. So the main thing I wanna point out is that we have reviewed primarily things that cause genital ulcerations. So we talked about herpes, we talked about primary syphilis, we also talked about secondary syphilis. We talked about LGV. We talked about chancroid. We talked about granuloma inguinale. We talked about MPOX. And all of those things, except secondary syphilis, um, are associated with genital ulcers. And then DGI, a little bit of a different thing, but does have dermatologic manifestations as a potential uh, presentation. The primary means of diagnosis for each of these entities is different. So herpes might be by a PCR, syphilis. By dark field microscopy would be the gold standard if you have it, but almost no, nobody has it. So usually by serology, LGV is diagnosed typically with a, with a nucleic amplification test that's positive for chlamydia in a person who has the right sort of clinical presentation. So if a person had proctitis that was pretty severe and they had a rectal NAT that was positive for chlamydia, even if you don't have LGV specific testing, that could still be LGV. Chancroid is usually a diagnosis of exclusion, granuloma inguinale, really don't see that. MPOX is by lesion PCR and DGI, like I said, either a culture at a disseminated site or a NAP that's positive in the right clinical scenario. You will have this slide as a reference for all the treatment options for both the recommended treatment and the alternative treatments. I would like to thank everybody who contributed slides or thoughts for this talk. I'd like to thank all of you for being here and participating. That makes it so much more fun for me. And I think I can end a little bit, a few minutes early and we'll just take questions. And if there are some left over from Stephanie's talk, maybe we can cover those too. All right. Thank you for that round of applause for Dr. Kelly Johnson. I'm gathering my penis is here. Um, we're gonna take a question in the room first. Any questions in the room? Okay, here, I'm gonna actually do something that's gonna make you ask a question, Annalise. 
you asked a question in the last session. So I'm giving you, would you like a penis or a hat? <laughs> penis, okay. And which flesh tone are you interested in? I have light to dark. You want the dark flesh tone? Excellent, enjoy your penis. Okay, if you ask a question, you get a penis or a hat. Ooh, Terry, you have a, don't you have a penis and a hat? So you can ask a question. And then we'll take a question from online. Yes. Uh, that was great, Kelly. Um, Thank you, Terry. Not a question, but just a comment about MPOX, the, the ulceration that we saw a lot of with MPOX was primarily when people were uncircumcised and it was mm -hmm. under the foreskin. It just looked different than other places on the body and it would sort of erode and ulcerate. It could last for a long time, which you could mistake if there weren't other lesions on the rest of the skin. It's, that's what I thought. Thank you. That's super helpful to have that context. Appreciate it. That was kind of a comment and not a question, but do you want it? That's okay. Do you want it was a, a helpful comment. Do you want a penis? You don't want a penis. Okay, fine. Um, how about a question from online, Allison? Okay, so because some of the ulcers are hard to identify, is the recommendation to do testing and treat based on what you think is based on the presentation? That's a really good question. I would say it depends a bit on the context. So for example, if I had a person who was pregnant, especially if they were far along in their pregnancy and they came in with something that I thought was a chancre, I would go ahead and test that person. If you have like point of care diagnostics, that's super helpful. But if you don't, I would test them and I would treat them on that day just to give them the chance of effectively treating their baby before the baby was delivered. Ideally, you would start therapy 30 or more days from when the baby was born as an opportunity to prevent congenital syphilis. And then I think in terms of herpes, if somebody says they have really, really painful lesions and they look really classic for herpes, especially the person that has like a history of herpes, then I would be tempted to go ahead and say, yes, I'll swab you, but I think this is probably herpes and reasonable to start therapy, though also testing for um, syphilis at the same time. For MPOX, I think the person would have to be pretty, pretty in dire straits, pretty ill for me to feel pushed to start empiric antiviral therapy without a diagnosis, just because most people, again, do sort of get better on their own. So happy to hear. I know there are many clinicians in the room, so happy to hear if folks disagree with me on that one, but I think that would be my approach. Uh, do we have any other questions online? Because if not, I want to just make a quick comment about some of the things that Dr. Sure, Johnson We do. Um, you showed the one image of someone with cervical HSV. Is that symptomatic? That's a really good question. I imagine that it would be, but I honestly don't know that I have seen it. Do, do, does clinicians in the room, it looks like Betamy, who also sees a ton of patients, yeah. have hands up. I mean, I would be surprised if there weren't lesions elsewhere. Yeah, that's a really good point, yeah. The one case that I've seen, um, the patient did also have what she thought was an ingrown hair, but like an external lesion associated with cervical findings. Yeah, and, and um, it's highly likely that uh, she would have vaginal discharge as well. It's very purulent. Um, and and the, for some reason she got a speculum exam. So she had symptoms of some sort, right? Yeah, I would also point. say in, in reference to the um, MPOX, um, I agree with absolutely everything you said. Um, we saw in the summer of 2022, people who would initially present with a pretty mild case and then three to five days later, it would be explosive. Mm -hmm. So I, if you're not going to treat someone or refer someone to stomp for treatment, just have them stay in touch. Mm, like close follow-up if, if you're not going to treat. Yeah. Fair point. And I'm just going to make a comment about the, do you guys remember the, the HSV, the herpes ulcer in the penile urethra? So I had a patient like this in clinic and, um, you know, sometimes people come in and they say it burns when, it, you know, it burns when I pee, but this person was like, I feel like I'm peeing out knives. You know what I mean? So it was very severe and he also had a prodrome. So he felt kind of malaise and fatigue and some muscle aches and ended up having, uh, so I was like, I'm just gonna look. And there was a lesion right at the tip of his urethra, not inside actually at the tip. Uh, I saw a hand up here. Uh, yes. I was just gonna say, uh, I saw uh, cervical lesions I thought was dysplasia and it turned out to be herpes and she was completely asymptomatic. Oh, wow. That's good to know. And would, quickly. would you like a penis for that comment? <laughs> okay. Oh, a hat. Okay. You can have a hat. Okay. And I believe we are at time. Allison, I'm sorry. Oh, one more minute, actually. Go ahead. Is there a question? This is an interesting public health question. What is so different about the HSV virus that we still don't have a vaccine for it? Oh, that's such a can of worms. Yeah. I am not, I'm going to, Ina, can you take that one? Why is there no vaccine for HSV? Well, first of all, it's just not that easy to develop one. There have been so many different right. candidates that have yeah. been tried. I will tell you, um, so they've just failed. Most of them have failed. 
Um, and one of the issues is right now that there's a lot of attention being paid to a, a GSK has a vaccine that's in phase two clinical trials, it's therapeutic. So for people who already have HSV to reduce shedding and outbreaks, and it looks very promising, but again, you know, it takes so much money and so much time, unless it's COVID, right, to get a vaccine to market. But um, there have been many, I can think of like 10 off the top of my head, different vaccine candidates that have been tried. So it's not for lack of trying. It's same with HIV, yeah, right? People have been trying that. with HIV right. forever. So yeah. some, some organisms are just more difficult to develop vaccines to. But right now, the attention I feel like in the field is really on therapeutic vaccines for people living with HSV2 and not so much on, on prophylactic. Yeah. I think from the HIV world, I was going to make that same point that also a ton of vaccine candidates have been tried. Yeah. And some of the problem seems to be that there may be reservoirs of HIV in the body that are just really hard to get at. And I wonder if there's something similar going on with HSV, since that can also sort of live latently at nerve roots and whatnot. Right. So that's just one of the reasons why it's so difficult is that as soon as you get infected with HSV, it goes into the spinal cord and goes into a dormant state and then gets reactivated. So it's hard, you know, to design it. A therapeutic vaccine for that reason as well is that there is a you know latent state in this in the spinal column um but it's 10 40. so you guys can take a break get more coffee and um we're going to start at 10 50 and for those of you that are in the room at 10 50 we have another prize i want to introduce dr franco chevalier he is a internist and id doc and completed his residency in florida at charles e schmidt school of medicine and he did his fellowship at UCSF and also has an MPH from UC Berkeley. He's our deputy um, medical director at City Clinic. And I'm very excited. He's going to introduce our panelists who are going to discuss some interesting cases from the clinic. Franco, take it away. I'm going to pull up your slides. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, so now we're going to be segueing now into uh, our lovely panel, who is really going to be the true highlight of the of the session here. I'm just yeah. going to be here as the moderator, um, and they're really going to be the ones sort of guiding us through these cases and sort of answering a lot of the questions that you all may have. Um, so I'm going to start introducing them all the way from the far right to my far right, uh, starting with Betterme Prince, who is one of our nurse practitioners at San Francisco City Clinic. Then in the middle is Terry Marcotte, who's also one of our nurse practitioners at San Francisco City Clinic. And then we have Miriam Pellegrini, who's visiting us from Strat and Magnet, who's also one of the nurse practitioners there. Um, and we're gonna, yep, thank you. So yes, I'm gonna be relying heavily on them in terms of answering a lot of the questions. And I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the uh, housekeeping rules in terms of how the panel is gonna go um, and also for questions and whatnot. So. We're gonna to try to see if in the next 60 minutes we can review four cases, at the very least, at least hopefully three. Um, and then throughout the case, I may pause with some poll questions for the audience. Uh, we'll try to do the same things that we've been doing throughout the different presentations. And then I'm gonna direct most of my questions and thought process to the panel uh, who will be answering and guiding us through sort of their knowledge and how they sort of approach these cases. And then at the end of each case, I'll take a pause to take maybe one or two questions, depending on if time allows. If we see that we're a little crunch for time, I may actually just omit that until the very end. Um, so just bear with us as we try to go through the cases, okay? So panel, are we ready? Let's do it. So let's see. This is not moving. Okay. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Did it move? I'm on case one here, but not there. One second, oh, one please. Second. Awesome. Yep. All right, yeah. so we have a 20-year-old MSM here uh, who's on PrEP and Doxypep, um, and it's actually referred to San Francisco City Clinic because of concerns of resistant pharyngeal gonorrhea. A little bit on the history of this 20-year-old gentleman. Um, around September of 2023, uh, had developed some sore throat and bilateral conjunctival erythema, uh, was found to have positive TMA testing for gonorrhea of the pharynx at that time, and received the adequate treatment of ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams IM, one-time dose. Then 15 days later, uh, reports back with a test of cure and has a repeat TMA testing that reveals now that once again, it is positive for pharyngeal gonorrhea. When you ask the patient, they deny receiving any more treatment since the initial injection and now presents to San Francisco City Clinic where now Marion works, because I'm going to ask you that next question, Marion. <laughs> But before we go there, I guess I want to ask the audience a quick question. 
Uh, so I'm not sure if we have the poll online or not, because I'm really interested to see uh, sort of the knowledge in terms of this right now. But what is your approach to pharyngeal gonorrhea test of cure? Um, and just by a show of hands, you know, there is really no wrong or, or right answer here. It's just more to sort of seek, um, engage what the audience knows about this. But first and foremost, how many of you get rec recommended to your patients when they get, okay, I see a couple of hands there. How about of you, how many of you do not recommend it to your patients? Anyone? Okay. How many of you would say that you recommend it only when an alternative regimen is used for treatment, thinking that maybe they won't get better? Nobody. Okay. Um, how about, I have no clue what a test of cure for pharyngeal gonorrhea is. All right. I see a few hands. And how are we doing on the audience poll? Is anybody answering? Um, most people do recommend it. And then a few people had no clue there was one. Awesome. Well, that is why we're here. <laughs> okay. So now panelists, and I'll start with you, Marion, if that's okay. What is, so now you have this patient who has a positive pharyngeal gonorrhea test, uh, who presents after 14 days post-treatment, and now is found to have a positive test again. So what is your, what is the most likely explanation for this? And how would you approach this particular patient? Hello? Okay. Well, how I would approach, uh, well, uh, the most likely cause for this, um, I would be getting a very good history of any um, potential re-exposures because um, at 15 days um, after initial treatment, um, uh, usually we tell people to wait seven days before having sex again, let your partners know so that they can go get tested and uh, treated. Um, and um, sometimes people don't wait the entire 14 days before they come back in for a test right. of cure. Uh, it's pretty common uh, with some of my patients. Um, so I, I would be thinking this is a reinfection. Um, and in terms of uh, a approach um, at that point, you know, if they said that they had not had any other sexual contacts um, uh, after that, then uh, if I was highly suspecting a, a, a treatment um, uh, resistance. Um, I would be treating with one gram of ceftriaxone plus uh, two grams of azithromycin. And I would be retesting with a NAT test. Um, for those, if you don't know, that's the, the little tube swab, um, the optimas. Um, and I would also be culturing with another swab on like a little Petri dish. Um, and because uh, we have the opportunity to do that at our clinic. Um, um, for uh, uh, gonorrhea susceptibility um, testing. Um, for those who don't have that ac access, you, I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've heard, I haven't tried this yet, but um, that Quest can do uh, susceptibility testing through there. Um, and there's like a code for that. Um, if you look on the California CDC guidelines, they have, mm. they have some information about that. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I, you pretty much answer a lot of the questions that I was going to ask you just now. Uh, however, um, I guess I would like to hear more from you, but also panel, feel free to share um, any other questions that you might ask in this setting. You mentioned something about you think that this might be a reinfection. Could you comment a little bit more on some of the questions that you might ask a patient that comes in with a positive TOC in terms of differentiating between, is this really reinfection or are we really concerned for treatment failure here? Um, and I guess um, if it is reinfection versus a treatment failure, will, would you change your management? Would you give just a repeat dosing of treatment for gonorrhea versus like what you're alluding to of giving uh, ceftriaxone plus acetromycin? Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so getting a, a, a good history like, um, is, is very important, like really talking about the types of sex that people are engaging in um, and, you know, the kinds of conversations that they're having and um, with their uh, partners about um, if they're, you know, notifying their partners that they'd had a positive test. Um, um, if if they had had any kind of sex, I would be just retreating with the standard treatment of the 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone. Anyone else want to add? 
Uh, well, just that, that question about getting a sexual history, I, I, in my mind, I think about, I'm going to ask this person probably five different ways if they've had sexual contact since the last <laughs> visit. Cause you know, you might ask it first, oh, did you have any sexual contact? And they'll say no, but then it, you know, a few minutes later, I'll just, what about, what about oral sex? Or have you had a penis in your mouth? Or, you know, I just kind of re repeat it. And, and sometimes it'll come up later in the visit that, oh, actually I did do something. That's one thing. And then the, the other thing, I mean, I've seen a couple of people, we do get these calls at city clinic and we have people come in to, most clinics can't do cultures in my experience. And so, and we can do cultures at city clinic. So we'll bring them in and then, and, and often if it's a really good story that they did not have sexual contact, their test is still positive, And then we give this higher dose treatment. And then the test that we do, that we do on the day they came into clinic is actually, by then it's actually negative. And so we, there's a cutoff for how quickly after treatment for gonorrhea, you can do, reliably do a test and try to avoid a false positive. And in the throat, we say 14 days, but I don't think that's a hard and fast mm. rule. We know that it could probably be a little bit longer than that, so. I mean, I think I would very specifically ask if their partners had been treated for the exposure. Um, and if they'd had sex again with specific people they'd had sex with before they got treated the first time. Thank you all for that. I think that I, I really, oh, go ahead, Mary, oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, Noles, um, I, I do talk, it's 15 days is, uh, that's, I, I like that, after, <laughs> just like that mm -hmm. one day over the 14 days. <laughs> but um, if someone does uh, come in and retest a little bit too soon, um, that, you know, it's important to let people know that like you want to wait. I, I like to tell people wait at least two weeks before testing or testing anywhere else. Because sometimes they go between our two clinics uh, <laughs> um, because it, it, those um, those uh, NAT tests, they can pick up like even a piece of like dead bacteria and that can get, you know, I let them know th this test can't tell between alive bacteria or dead bacteria. So just to refrain from retesting too soon. No, thank you all for those comments. I really want to reemphasize that, you know, that 14 day cutoff is not like a hard stop, meaning that it, it's at least 14 days, but really like, you know, really emphasizing that at least waiting for that time period, because otherwise it's really difficult to interpret really in the context of everything that the patients may be experiencing. And also just how do you interpret this positive test? Like to your point, Marion, of like, you know, it can pick up traces of even dead bacteria. So just knowing that um, I'm just going to quickly, I'm not sure why it's doing this. Let's see. Zoom slideshow. There we go. Perfect. Sorry, oh, no, no, it's all good. Uh, so I just want to quickly emphasize a couple of different things that, um, that a lot of people in the audience may know already, but obviously resistant gonorrhea is of high concern, obviously here in the US, and there's an urgent public health threat that the CDC has put out. As we know that internationally, there's been multiple reported cases of resistant gonorrhea, uh, more specifically, however, in Europe, Asia, and Australia. Um, just for brief sort of historical uh, data here in 2016, there was a cluster of cases with very high MICs or um, um, minimum inhibition concentrations for acetromycin and reduced susceptibility to ceftriaxone that was discovered in Hawaii. And then in January of 2023, there was multi-drug non-susceptible gonorrhea in Massachusetts. Uh, there was a um, couple of cases there, but there hasn't really been any reported cases of treatment failure in the US. So, so I think it's really important to really at least drive that point forward. Um, and as part of a, a Sin City Clinic and also at Magnet and Strat, we are part of the search projects, which is essentially um, a collaborative effort initiation that the CDC put out, I believe back in like 2016, as a way to sort of uh, create an enhanced surveillance and capacity uh, program to be able to identify uh, potential resistant gonorrhea. And so uh, part of the test of cure kind of emerged from that. And I think that uh, the big important thing here to highlight is that where this test of cure came about, was essentially from the 2021 CDC STI treatment guidelines, which basically said that any person with pharyngeal gonorrhea should return seven to 14 days after initial treatment for a test of cure by using either culture or NAT. However, testing at seven days might result in an increased likelihood of false positive tests. And that's really where this whole idea of at least waiting 14 days really comes about, because as you can see, you know, at day eight, you can still have 13% of individuals that can test positive, but then at day 14, that number goes down to like 8% or so, at least on evidence. And so it's really important to understand that, but also that antibiotic penetration into the pharynx or the oropharynx region is suboptimal. And so that's where the thought process of uh, test of cure really comes from. Um, but most importantly as well, 
is that if there is a place where gonorrhea may develop resistance, is that antibiotic resistance can be more likely to emerge in the pharynx. And that's simply because there could be potential transfer of plasmids from non-pathogenic Neisseria that already colonizes our oral pharynx. And so that's something to at least keep in mind. And so that segues us into what do we do in terms of uh, suspected GC treatment failures? And as we, uh, the panel has pretty much alluded to, when a patient comes in for that test of cure or for suspected GC treatment failure, essentially what you really want to do is not only just do a NAD test, but also collect a culture um, and potentially get in touch with your local health department to really get some guidance if you need any help. Um, obviously, San Francisco City Clinic serves as a resource, so feel free to give us a call if there's ever a question, um, and the number will be provided in a couple of slides uh, later on. But as far as repair treatment, treatment, if you determine based on your questions and your level of suspicion that this is reinfection, obviously repeating the treatment with ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams IM times one is warranted. But if you do indeed suspect treatment failure in this setting, as Marion uh, absolutely uh, alluded to, ceftriaxone one gram IM as well as acetromycin, two grams PO would be the standard of therapy. And this is what we do also at San Francisco City Clinic in those settings. Um, and obviously reporting that within 24 hours to your local health department for further investigation might be warranted as well. Um, and making sure that you really drive the point of treating all partners in the last 60 days with the same regimen, just to ensure that there is no reinfection and that if there is uh, ongoing sexual activity with those partners, that they at least are not passing it on to each other. Um, and like we said, I would probably put a big scratch on the seven, but test of cure at least at 14 days with culture and not testing. I'm learning this computer, so bear with me. Let's see. It's moving along. So at this point, I believe that we can pause for maybe one or two questions either from the audience or online. So does anybody have any questions for our panel at this point in the context of test of cure or gonorrhea? Seems like we don't have anything online, but I see a hand raised back there. This is the question that if you don't have access to a test of cure, what would you do in that setting? Panel, would you like to uh, take a stab at that? Well, if the clinic doesn't have one, because at our clinic, we send it home with the patient and they mail it in, which is great convenience for them. But if, if the clinic doesn't have that capacity, I would just schedule them to come in and repeat. And just to, I mean, we've already sort of said about we're not doing test to cure on every gonorrhea. It's really just in the throat, so. I see one more question back there. I can always repeat the question since I can hear it. Yeah, sure. Anybody wants to answer? Yeah, I, I would. I, oh. Oh, yeah, sorry. I should repeat the question. If we're still seeing 8% of positive tests uh, with the test of cure at 14 days, is there a reason why not wait longer, something like 20 days or so? Mostly because uh, my, um, the patients that we see don't wait that long. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the data, but I suspect a large number of our patients don't do the 14 day test of cure. And I do think it's just gonna get more and more unrealistic to expect people to do that. I just wanted to make a quick comment along those same lines, Betamy, which is I've recently been asked like how much effort should we put into this? Like how hard should we try to get our patients back in for the test of cure? And my personal opinion is that it's not the highest priority activity for you. I think it's good for patients to know that there is this recommendation, try to make it easy for them if you can, by giving them a kit to take home or scheduling them to come back. But if they don't, it's okay. This is um, you know, a, a recommendation that emerged in the 2021 guidelines for the reasons that Dr. Chevalier outlined, but it's not, um, it's not the end all and be all of STI prevention and control. So make an effort, but I would not spend like huge resources tracking down your patients who don't come in for a test of cure. And importantly, we wanted you to understand this issue of reinfection and possible false positives, which are like the most common explanations for this. So yeah, 
I just want to chime in. With awesome. That. Thank you. No, Thank you. I'd love to help. <laughs> um, so no, so um, we're going to move forward now so that we can completely advance to the next cases and try to see if we can get through all of them. So this takes us to case number two. So this is a 59 year old MSW or men who have sex with women presenting with red spots on the penis for about a day, as well as some inguinal lymphadenopathy that has been present for about three days. A little bit more on this patient's history. Uh, they report casual, casual sex encounters with cisgender female sex worker while they were traveling in China about roughly about 1.5 months ago or one and a half months ago. Um, they also report sexual activity with their wife five days prior to the presentation to the clinic. Um, and they were interestingly seen by their primary care doctor two days prior to coming to us um, and was given some lab orders. However, they did not complete them prior to the visit um, to City Clinic. As far as the exam and laboratory testing, uh, the exam was significant for a, pos a notable positive indurated ulcer um, that kind of looked like a mass over the distal penile shaft. It was non-tender, and the patient had right inguinal lymphadenopathy that was also present. Um, we attempted to do a dark field microscopy, given that we had suspicions, um, and this was negative. And we also did a stat RPR to rule out, is this a case of syphilis? And that was also non-reactive. Um, then an RPR and a TPPA were sent during the visit, and those were pending as there were a send out. A little bit more. Um, six days later, the patient tells you that they are not improving. Their symptoms are still, go are still going on, and so they go to their primary care doctor, um, and the PCP decides to repeat tests. And at that time, when they repeat the tests, um, they found that they had a negative RPR, and now they have a positive TPPA. So they returned to San Francisco City Clinic six days later with this new result information, um, and they undergo repeat RPR and TPPA testing with us, and then receive one dose of Visillin, 2.4 million units for presumptive primary syphilis. The repeat testing from treatment day, that when the day that he got the injection, results with the following, a positive TPPA, a reactive RPR, and now the titers are read as one to four. So, if this works, there we go. Let's see, better me. How would you explain this result? So just for a quick sort of roadmap here, initial visit, all testing negative, day six, you have a reactive TPPA. And on the day of treatment, now we have this positive test. So this is a really great case for showing how people's tests come back really early on. So it is possible to have symptomatic syphilis, to have a chancre and have all your tests be negative. Ideally, the dark field would be positive and I'm not sure why it wasn't at that time, um, but that's the only way you would be able to pick syphilis up this early on. And um, when a test becomes positive, it's almost always the TPPA or the treponemal test that's gonna come back positive first. So what we do when we see a lesion, we're very suspicious. We don't just send an RPR and wait for it to be reflex to the TPPA. We force a TPPA because we know that's more likely to be positive first. Um, and then this all happened in the matter of less than two weeks the day after he got his positive TPPA results, um, he came back to City Clinic. And then at that point, his RPR was reactive as well. Awesome. Thank you. And I know that you mentioned the um, sending both the RPR and the TPPA. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I have missed it. But do you mind clarifying to the audience that in which settings would you actually send both at the same time as opposed to sending the, the reflex? I mean, anytime you have a lesion and you syphilis is on your differential, an ulcer, something that you think could be a chancre, I would add the TPPA, um, like force it and not do it as a reflex. Awesome, thank you. And I guess on that note, we obviously have RPRs, TPPAs, sometimes there's EIA or treponemal antibody. Do you mind talking or explaining to the audience a little bit about the difference in testing, like wh which ones are which and um, you know, just a little bit more information on what the differences are. Sure. So um, most places nowadays do what we call the reverse algorithm. So they run a treponemal test, usually an EIA as the very first pass. Um, and that is a very sensitive test, a little less specific. 
And when that comes up positive, the next step is always to run a non-treponemal test, usually an RPR. And if the, um, the EIA is positive and the RPR is non-reactive, then you run a tiebreaker, usually a TPPA. Um, the old, and then it's definitely syphilis. If both the TPPA and the RPR are non-reactive, it's not syphilis. And the traditional algorithm, which we still do at City Clinic, is to start with a, a non-treponemal test, an RPR. And if that's reactive, reflex it to a TPPA. The advantage of starting with a treponemal test is that anyone that's at any stage of syphilis should have a positive treponemal test. So you're gonna pick up old cases, newer cases. Um, in a high prevalence setting like City Clinic, so many people have had syphilis before. If you start with a test that's gonna be positive in anyone that's had syphilis before, you're gonna have a ton of positives. So in that setting, it makes sense to start with the RPR because we're looking for changes in titers. Um, and anyone that you know has had syphilis before, there's just no point in starting with the treponemal test because you know it's gonna be positive. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, so we're gonna move forward now with the case. And I just want to, uh, again, just kind of reemphasize some of the information that, that Betamy um, has sort of uh, pointed out. As, as we heard, non there's non-treponemal and treponemal tests. And just for the audience purposes, RPR and VDRL are the ones that we generally think of as non-treponemal tests. And these usually are testing for the antibodies to the bystander inflammation that's associated with syphilis. Um, and usually the reactivity fluctuates with the cis activity. And if positive, they will be reported with a, a titer, as we sort of alluded to for in our previous case. Um, and really the big thing to keep in mind is that the, four, the fourfold change, whether up or down, it's really what's significant when interpreting syphilis. I mean, the context of uh, an inf a new infection or actually response to treatment, we're always looking for that full, full change. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but as far as the troponemal test, the TPPA, the EIA, and the MHATP, these are highly specific for antibodies to uh, troponema pallidum. Um, and once positive, will always be positive, as Bedroom says. And so it's hard to interpret if someone's already had syphilis um, when they're positive, because it will always be positive in the context of a new infection. And these tend to be more sensitive than non troponemal tests for just very early primary syphilis and late latent syphilis as well. And then as Betamy sort of alluded to as well, the traditional sequencing uh, testing usually starts with a non-treponemal test and then reflexes to a treponemal test if positive. Um, and so that's something to just keep in mind. Um, and the other thing that we sort of put down here was that reactive non-treponemal plus a reactive treponemal indicates potential syphilis, whereas a reactive non-treponemal um, and a non-reactive treponemal test is generally considered to be a biologic false positive, which can happen in the context of inflammatory processes and things of that nature. And so there are certain conditions that patients can have that could actually result in a biologic false positive in this setting. So panel, actually better me, again, since you were so good at this, um, you deal with this actually on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, uh, better me is one of our individuals that actually responds to our reactor tests when we have positive uh, uh, titers and sort of like uh, this point cases and to see whether or not they're primary syphilis, late latent, whether or not they need treatment or not, or if simply if the patients need to come in for repeat testing. Would you be so kind to take us through the normal titer changes that are seen with an initial, initial syphilis infection and also the follow-up infections after treatment? Sure. Okay. So just like everything else, when someone is first infected with syphilis, there are no signs, nothing you can see, no tests that will be positive. And after usually a few weeks, people will develop a chancre. And then around the same time, or as we saw from this case, a little bit after that, they will start to have positive serologies. Um, and like we said, the treponemal test, in this case, the TPPA, will become positive a little sooner than the RPR or VDRL. And then without treatment, um, the RPR will continue to go up until someone's treated. And after they're treated, we will be checking them regularly, usually every three months. And what we're looking for is a fourfold drop in their titer from the day of treatment. So it's really important to try to get a titer on the day that you treat somebody. You may have a positive test, you call them in 
bring them back in for treatment. But you really want to track their response to treatment from the day that you give them their treatment. And so this person's titer came down beautifully after treatment. And as you can see, the treponemal test will just be positive and continue to be positive. And then if they do become reinfected, the way you'll know is that if they develop a titer once again. So if they had a little bit of a titer, um, even after coming down fourfold, you're looking for a fourfold increase in their titer. So if they came down from one to 64 to one to four, they're treated, they don't have to go to non-reactive. If they go up to one to eight, that's okay. But if they go up to one to 16, then you consider them to be reinfected and you treat them again. And as usual, track their titers and look for a fourfold decrease over a year. So you've got a while, it's not gonna happen instantly. It could easily take 12 months for that response to happen. And some people, like I alluded to, will not go all the way down to non-reactive after treatment. Again, it doesn't matter as long as they've come down fourfold over the course of a year. And from then on, we see people who stay at one to four for years and years, and then one day they come in with a titer of one to 32. We know they've been reinfected. You still need to get those regular screening titers. Right. And then you don't treat people and their titers still come down. <laughs> and um, that's why the treponemal test is a great screening test um, because we often like, for example, we get a lot of folks who need to get syphilis testing for immigration. Don't ask me why. And um, all of a sudden they turn out to have a, a positive treponemal test. We have no idea when they were infected and we have to treat them, but we treat them for late latent. We don't have a previous titer to compare it to. We don't have a previous TPPA to compare it to. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I just quickly, quickly wanna segue back to uh, when we were talking about the reverse sequence syphilis screening, um, which essentially is when we start with an EIA test um, and in the setting of a negative test at that point, generally speaking, that will be, and that will indicate not syphilis or not an, a syphilitic infection. And then in the setting of a positive EIA or CIA, at that point, we'll then uh, perform the RPR to gauge the cis activity. And if positive, that generally indicates or correlates with syphilitic infection, whether past or present. And then based obviously on the history, the symptoms that the patients are presenting with, that will obviously help determine what stage or if any, um, the patient may have, or if they've been previously treated. Uh, however, if negative, a second treponemal test, usually a TPPA, will be performed. And in the setting of a positive test, again, that will also hint at the fact that it is a past or present syphilitic infection. However, if that is also negative and all you have to work with now is a positive EIA, that could actually mean an unconfirmed EIA that's unlikely syphilis or a false positive. Um, but if you do have a high suspicion that this could be a patient that may be at risk, and that you do suspect that this patient could potentially have syphilis, like we've sort of talked in the setting of a primary syphilis or early syphilitic infection, really the, the, the takeaway is to repeat testing in one month to ensure that you're not missing a potential syphilis case. Um, this right here, I'm actually, for the sake of time, not going to go through it. This is actually going to be more for your uh, sort of guidance. Um, this is just a quick sort of cheat sheet in, in terms of some of the most common interpretations and test results that you may find uh, when you send out uh, syphilis tests. And so this might be a good guide, but obviously if there's ever any questions or if there's any sort of uh, uh, ambiguity in the testing or interpretation, feel free to obviously place an e-consult if you are part of the CSFG system uh, to City Clinic or give us a call as well to try to, to try to talk to one of our syphilis experts like the ones here on the panel today so that they can help you sort of and guide you through the, uh, the cases as well. Now, panel, back to you. When, if ever, this is my favorite emoji, by the way, I use it excessively, <laughs> but when, if ever, would you consider treatment in a patient whose EIA or T polydom antibody test is positive? However, everything else is pending because generally patients will come back, but let's say if you ever entertain treatment, when would you do that? I've got the microphone. So, um, I mean, someone who has a lesion that's really suspicious, um, 
you might lose them to follow up. You're worried you won't get them treated if, if you don't do it that day. Um, the history is very suspicious. There are contact to a known syphilis case. Or if they've had a negative uh, TPPA and now all of a sudden it's right. um, reactive. I overheard someone from the audience saying also pregnancy as well, which yes, um, to that point, um, basically everything that you all said, including that. So consider treatment based on an initial positive syphilis test if the patient does not have a prior history of syphilis and they have high risk factors for syphilis, they have signs or symptoms of syphilis, it's a recent contact to syphilis or it may be difficult to reach after the visit. And like someone in the audience, actually I heard whisper um, in the context of pregnancy as well. Now, if you ever want to assess whether patients has a history of syphilis, uh, because say the patient may have been traveling through San Francisco when you are living in a different jurisdiction where you may not have access to that, um, obviously, making sure that you search uh, for prior history titers. And the best way to do that is generally contacting the health department from that facility. Um, in the context of San Francisco, you can call city clinic during business hours or place an e-consult if you're seeking some history on the patient's titers. And we can definitely guide you or at least give you some historical data that we may have um, on that individual's uh, previous hist uh, syphilis uh, history. The other thing to just uh, keep in mind, I'm not really gonna harp too much on this right here, but it's just in the context of treatment, the big thing that you really want to remember is primary, secondary, and early latent, meaning less than one year. You're just going to treat with one injection of 2.4 million units of uh, benthicin penicillin, IM times one, um, and then continue to monitor the patients. But if it's late latent um, in the context of uh, treatment, you're going to do three injections. You're going to do uh, three time, uh, seven days apart. You can have a little bit of leeway of six to 10 days gap. That's okay. Uh, however, you also may want to consider making sure that you always uh, rule out things like neurosyphilis at all stages. And if so, plus or minus treatment for neurosyphilis in the context of identifying that. Now, if the patient is allergic to penicillin, you can always consider the alternatives, which are depicted here. That would be doxycycline 100 milligrams PO twice a day for 14 days for primary, secondary, and early latent, um, and doxycycline for 28 days in the context of late latent. But if you're uh, treating a pregnant woman, um, that is penicillin allergic, desensitization is necessary. So desensitizing the patient is actually paramount in that setting. As far as the follow-up, again, I'm not going to go through all of this here. This is just more for your guidance. But really, when we're talking about this fourfold decline that we all care about, and, and we want to make sure that patients are responding adequately, keeping in mind that 12 months for early syphilis, it can take up to 12 months for patients to actually have that fourfold decline. So if you see that it's moving slowly, don't uh, do not fret, just wait patiently and continue to monitor for 12 months. But in the context of late latent syphilis and also for individuals living with HIV, 24 months um, is how long it can take for patients to actually have that nice decline post-treatment. However, if you're ever in doubt, if you need someone to just give you some TLC in the context of waiting for those titers, our number is right here, 628-217-6677 or place a consult. So, before we move to case three, let's take maybe one question real quick. I was just wondering if you could comment on like the penicillin supply chain because I mean, you're talking about penicillin so much. Would you like to take that one, Terry? Or Stephanie, anyone? Well, I, I don't know the answer. So, I mean, right now we're doing well. Actually, before before you answer, sorry, sorry about that. I keep forgetting that we don't have a mic over there. But the question was, in terms of the penicillin supply, can we comment on that since we've been talking about the penicillin shortage um, in the last few months to like year or so? Um, I don't know the big picture. I, I know that San Francisco and City Clinic in particular, we had low supply and we were kind of conserving use for pregnant people, but um, now we certainly have, we have a, a better supply right now. So we've gone back to using penicillin, but I don't know the big picture or long-term. Stephanie or Oliver Franco. Yeah, thanks. I didn't quite see who, who asked the question. Just curious. Oh, hi. Thank you for the good question. Yeah. It's been really challenging and frustrating and like totally unacceptable that we have this nationwide shortage of benzathine penicillin G because we have one manufacturer who has a monopoly on it. But that all aside, um, it is supposed to improve by quarter two of this year. So 
they changed it to quarter four. Oh my God. Okay. Well, thank you, Kelly. That's why I was like, Kelly, do you want to answer this? Anyway, Fresh but there, price. so it's now supposed to improve by quarter four, but there is allocations intermittently available. So it's really hard to have a citywide recommendation right now to what to, what to do with rationing because every clinical setting has like sort of a different inventory. So um, ZSFG has been providing updates to inpatient and outpatient providers. Like Terry said, right now we have a robust supply, but we're monitoring, monitoring our inventory and kind of dialing up and down based on what we have. So I would say talk to your clinic administrators and pharmacists and check your local supply. Um, and it sounds like we're going to have, may have to do some more um, rationing this year if the, if the um, shortage goes on as long as currently projected. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's really breaking news, actually, about the extension of the bicycle <laughs> shortage um, just yesterday. And look out for a health alert coming from California Department of Public Health shortly. Um, I also wanted to just mention that you've probably seen in the news, or you may have seen in the news, um, extonsiline is a drug used elsewhere, mostly in France, to treat the same patients that you would use bicillin for, and the US FDA has been working to import extonsiline, so this is something that is available. I actually haven't heard of it being used at all, but it would be an option in any scenario where you would use bicillin. The main trick right now, though, is that we don't have a great way to pay for it with any of our like payment assistance programs, so it's pretty expensive, and that's a major downside it's on the order of hundreds of dollars, yes. I think it's hundreds for a, for a one dose, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyways, it's expensive. The other thing I just wanted to say since I have the mic is that if you don't live in San Francisco, so I know we have a lot of folks online too who may not live in San Francisco, if you have a question about syphilis titers or you need help, you can use STDCCN, it's stdccn.org. This reaches our faculty at the California Prevention Training Center um, and we'd be happy to help you too. I see a question over here. And we'll take just one more, Ina. That's yes. just I know you want to get to your next case. <laughs> Thank you. How do you counsel patients in terms of being contagious? Do you go by the results, like the lab results, or just like have a time frame? Uh, I, we counsel folks uh, seven days after treatment um, to abstain from sexual activity uh, until seven days after treatment. And since I have the mic, um, I just want to say a quick thing back about that, your question about if you only had a positive EIA and everything else was pending, the, the cases where you would treat, that's really kind of the exception, because I just want to highlight there are a lot of false positive syphilis tests. And so for us, we start with RPR. There's a lot of false positive RPRs, especially when it's a low titer. So if it's a low titer and I'm waiting for that confirmatory test, I'll, we'll usually wait. Or if there's a positive EIA and, it's, and there's not a compelling reason to treat, usually wait until the confirmatory tests are back. Awesome, thank you. So now we're going to move to case number three. Um, so this is a 35 year old MSMW, so sex with both men and women presenting with complaints of dysuria without urethral discharge. The patient also notes some itching and irritation around the urethral meatus. And upon further questioning in the history, they report sex with men and women, their last encounter being seven days prior to presentation. During that encounter, they're engaged in sexual activities with a male partner, um, engaged in anal insertive sex, and did not use any sort of protection um, in terms of condoms. In the last three months, they reported having sex with five new sexual partners. They had some STD testing done two months ago, all of which was negative, and they said it was GC, CT of all sites of exposure, as well as syphilis. They are on PrEP. They take PrEP 211. They're pretty adherent to it, so they tend to use it with every sexual encounter. Um, and they're also interested in doxypep during this visit because they've heard so much about it. Um, on their exam, however, um, you know that they don't have any urethral discharge. Um, they don't have any lymphadenopathy. They don't have any sort of testicular or penile pain or swelling. Um, so you send the patient to collect a urine sample. And when you spin the urine and take a look under the microscope, since we have the capacity to do that at uh, City Clinic, you notice that there's greater than 10 uh, white blood cells per high power field. Um, you did not see any bacteria, no red blood cells, no yeast. And so you decide to send the urine for gonorrhea and chlamydia, all of which are pending and may take up to two days to come back. And so you astutely treat the patient empirically with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days for a presumptive diagnosis of non-gonococcal urethritis. 
A week later, symptoms are unchanged despite the completion of therapy. Um, the patient actually went to urgent care because they were still having the symptoms and uh, had a workup that was significant just for positive leucasterase, uh, but negative nitrites in the urine. They were trying to rule out a UTI. They denied any more sexual activity since the diagnosis and senior in clinic and report full adherence to the treatment. They took it correctly twice a day for seven days. So you're concerned now for persisting erythritis at this point. And so for the audience, before we go to the panel, in addition to confirming uh, the patient took the doxycycline that the partner was treated, what would you do next? Would you treat them with acetromycin one gram PO times one? Would you treat them with metronidazole two grams PO times one? Would you treat with moxy, moxifloxacin 400 milligrams PO daily times seven days? See a few hands. What about moxifloxacin 400 milligrams PO daily for 10 days? Okay. So given that we have 10 minutes, panelists, what do you think could be happening here? Terry, would you like to take a stab at this? And also what test would you order given that we only send gonorrhea and chlamydia here? Um, and how would you treat this patient in the context of everything that we know right now? Uh, well, I deal, well, what did I say? Our protocol, what we do at our clinic, and I think is probably the right way to do it is if somebody with a penis comes in with dysuria or some kind of symptoms, <clears throat> we send gonorrhea, chlamydia, and mycoplasma testing at the first visit, um, just because we found that there's a high number of people with urethritis that actually have mycoplasma. Um, that test is not available everywhere. I don't think the wide, wider health department didn't have that test until a couple of years ago, and it's still kind of getting in people's minds to think about ordering that test when people are symptomatic. Um, so anyway, since we didn't have that at the first visit, I would send that now. And since he has uh, partners who with vagina, I would send a trick test also. Um, and given that he didn't respond after the first seven days, I don't, I think I probably would wait for the test results. Well, I, 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 you could, you, I could give moxifloxacin just a case, cause I know that about, I think 50 or 15 or 20% of our urethritis cases are from mycoplasma. So it's pretty high, high likelihood that that's what's going on. So I guess that's what I probably what I would do is give a moxifloxacin. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna to try to uh, fly through these slides right here, but just for the definition of non-gonococcal urethritis, generally it's a diagnostic criteria that it encompasses either the presence of mucopurulin or purulent discharge, um, as well as a, either gram stain that actually demonstrates the presence of at least two whites per high power field, meaning at 100X, um, or positive leucasterase in the, in the urine whenever you do a urine, uh, a urine dipstick, um, or greater than 10 whites per high power field when you um, look under the microscope to the urine sample, like we said on this case. Um, and as far as non-gonococcal urethritis, that encompasses inflammation of the urethra that's caused by pathogens other than gonorrhea. And so generally it's transmitted through oral, anal, and vaginal sex. And as you can see, symptoms can vary and they can pretty much present like anything in the context of STIs. Um, and the diagnosis, if there is discharge, generally gram staining uh, would be the way to sort of go. However, if you don't have any discharge, taking a look at the urine to ensure that you can establish a diagnosis is pivotal in order to be able to assess them. Um, as far as mycoplasma genitalium, with, um, with, uh, which um, Terry alluded to, is also Amgen, and it's usually how we refer to it, but it's an intercellular bacteria, uh, slow growing, very difficult to culture, and looks pretty much like the little plushie that someone got today. Um, and it can cause pretty much anything in the book. I put a big question mark on proctitis. However, I would say, I would dare to say that at least at San Francisco City Clinic, we do see cases of proctitis where the only thing that comes back positive in the context will be Mgen. And so whether or not Mgen is really the culprit or not, we generally tend to treat patients and they tend to get better um, in that setting. And so that's something um, up for, uh, for debate. Um, but as far as testing, who should we test? Well, the CDC says, People with symptoms or signs of persistent recurrent urethritis and cervicitis who fail initial treatment, um, as well consider testing with people with PID. But as Terry alluded at City Clinic, we actually test anyone that comes in with urethral symptoms in the context of MGM because we do know that it could be, uh, we have a pretty high prevalence of 15 to 20% of cases that can, uh, that can arise um, in the context of people having symptoms, but also contacts to patients with confirmed MGM. Um, and 
the general consensus is that we do not screen asymptomatic individuals for MGN. So when patients are coming in for regular PrEP testing and STI testing, uh, sorry, for PrEP follow-ups and STI testing, we do generally offer screening for asymptomatic individuals in the context of MGN. And why that is the case, um, but before we get there, uh, we're going to talk about the treatment guidelines, which is doxy and moxy. Um, before you would hear acetromycin being sort of like the, the, uh, the treatment recommendation, but that's no longer the case. And part of the reason for that is because there's been an increase in resistance in terms of macrolides. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through this slide right here, which actually shows that percentages that have been reported in terms of MGM macrolide resistance mutations in the U.S. in several cities. You can see here in North Carolina, up to like 70.6% report, reported resistance. And it's part of the reason why we don't even use or even entertain the idea of using macrolides at this point. Um, and in terms of fluoroquinolones, and part of the reason why we really don't screen asymptomatic individuals as a way to sort of minimize antibiotic exposure is because even though fluoroquinolones work, we are seeing a rise in resistance as well. You can see that it's up to like nearly 17% in some places as well. And so it is something to consider, you know, just treating people that truly have symptoms that actually test positive for it in the context of their symptoms. Um, and there are some alternative therapies that are listed here, but I think at the end of the day, because this is sort of like a new and also emerging thing in terms of resistance and other stuff, really emphasizing the expert consultation that if you ever have any questions beyond the context of doxy, moxy, and if you are entertaining uh, treatment failure or any other uh, things, to really call us or place any consult to really talk about, uh, talk it through um, and get some guidance on how to approach these cases as well. Um, and the last point that I want to make on this particular slide is that retesting for persistent symptoms uh, shouldn't really happen at least until three weeks after treatment, uh, because we do see false positives. Uh, it can be possible, and it's really hard to interpret that in the context of patient symptomology, but also just whether or not we need to even consider whether the person has a persistent infection or treatment failure. So at least waiting three weeks is really, really key. And it's something that we um, all the time are giving advice on the phone, but also talking to patients about when they call us back for retesting, because they want to make sure that they clear their infection. Um, and last but not least, the CDC really wants people to report MGN treatment failure. So if you ever are entertaining that diagnosis, um, there's the link, which will be provided on the slides. And this is what the page looks like. You will just have to input the patient's information um, in order for surveillance to take place in the context of that as well. So do I have time for any questions? Awesome. Yes, we have uh, five minutes for questions. We have some questions from the Perfect. virtual audience. Can uh, Allison, do you mind taking one of those? How do you treat exposure to MGen? The FPACT program only covers testing if the patient is symptomatic and partner treatment is not covered unless the test is positive. Any suggestions? I don't know how to address that billing issue because that is, that's, that's who you test. <laughs> Basically either people with symptoms or people with a known contact to it. Yeah. Um, I, can take, I can take that because a colleague of mine pointed that out and we emailed um, Michael Policar, who's with the Family Pack program and they're gonna work on changing that policy. So just to be continued, but um, Family Pack will be covering partner testing soon. And I think also the point is that we don't treat contacts for MGen unless they test positive. So we don't do the same sort of contact treatment, exposure treatment we do for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Yeah, and part of that reason is that, that you know, the commitment that you're making to treatment is two weeks of therapy. And so, and also moxifloxacin is not a totally benign drug. I see a question over here. I'm gonna I just wanted to yes, one quick comment around that too. So yeah, we're asking people to send their partners in for testing, but there's a bit of a dilemma when it's, for example, uh, men who have sex with other men that were testing positive. And we were finally able to validate a rectal swab for mycoplasma testing, but almost no one's gonna have access to that. So there were times that we were offering partner treatment to an MSM partner of a positive mycoplasma case. Hi, thank you. Has it changed? Is Family Pack now covering um, moxifloxacin for patients who have MGen? Uh, I don't know. Is, um, I don't know. Do you know if FPACT is covering moxifloxacin? Yeah, great question. Oh, Michael Policar's on there. Okay, yeah, maybe he can put it in the chat. Michael Policar, <laughs> if you're listening, does Family Pack Please. cover moxifloxacin <laughs> for folks with MGen? And um, would you like a penis? Oh, I have a hat. oh, you have a hat. Okay. 
Can I just say, I'm not getting that many takers on these penises and I'm getting significant stress relief from squeezing them. So trust me, you want one. Oh, you, are, you already have a product. No, you, get, you, know, you only get one price. All right, um, more questions. Oh, it is. It is now, Family Pact does cover Moxie boxes and yay. Okay, Tony. Is mycoplasma and the pharynx a thing? Ooh, that's Good question. Um, I, I think we all assume it is and that it's probably transmissible. And I don't think we have, uh, we don't definitely don't have a test yet commercially. Um, and it's, I think there's more to come, but I don't know if Stephanie or mm -hmm. why, why don't we care? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we know if it's a significant pathogen in the throat yet, but right. Oliver's like, we don't even want to know because it's just so hard with it for gen urogenital infections I mean, and I, as it is. I would think that the reason, I don't think it's gonna cause big problems in the throat, but the big issue is, are you gonna keep, you know, pass it to whoever, obviously. I think that's all the time we have, unfortunately. It is all the time, so thank you all. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to approach us at any time, thank you. Oliver Bacon is the medical director of San Francisco City Clinic, um, which you all know is run by the SFDPH. He is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Medicine as well. And he um, trained in internal medicine and infectious diseases. His areas of interest are obviously STIs, biomedical STI and HIV prevention and antiretroviral therapy and early treatment of um, HIV infection. And I'm gonna tell you, this is the meatiest talk of this whole session. And so that's why we saved it for last. And without further ado, Dr. Oliver Bacon. Thank you, Ina. Mm -hmm. um, thank you everyone for lasting this entire morning um, through those amazing talks. Um, I was so glad that I didn't have to give the panel talk. Franco, you did an amazing job. <laughs> and your pan the panelists were incredible. So I know that in the program, this is billed as a doxypep talk. It's actually um, what's new in biomedical prevention in the clinic. Um, so it's a little look at what's going on now and into the future. Um, interesting. So it's advancing there, but not here. That's all good. Let's see. No, 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 no. Okay. No, now it's working, now it's working, now it's working. Um, I have no disclosures. This is my disclaimer. What I say are my opinions, not those of the health department. If you don't like what I say, blame me, don't blame the health department. Okay, um, so this is what we're gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna talk about cabotegravir for prep, how to counsel folks, does it work? What the hell? Okay. I know, it's all so right. annoying. One second. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ina. Um, anyway, cabotegravir, um, how to counsel folks, uh, how to use it, how to do HIV testing around it, what to do about missed doses, um, doxypep, more on the how do you actually do it um, line of questions. Um, I don't think we're going to have time for the third topic, which is a very quick run through of how to handle lipid testing for people on TAF-based PrEP. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with these plushies, um, this is syphilis saying eek, chlamydia saying mercy, and gonorrhea saying eh, whatever. <laughs> All right, so case one. So this is a 37 year old HIV negative cisgender woman. She's on daily TDF FTC for PrEP. In the last 12 months, she's had 12 cisgender male partners. She has condomless, receptive anal and vaginal sex with hetero and bisexual cisgender men. Uh, she has a couple cocktails on the weekends. Um, she misses one to two doses of her prep every week. Um, luckily, she's not gone seven or more consecutive days without prep since her last HIV test. 
She took her most recent dose of TDF-FTC yesterday, and she says she's really, really tired of taking a pill every day. So audience thought question poll, what would you do? Would you say, nope, keep taking your daily prep and give some adherence counseling? Would you say, well, if you're tired of daily prep, why don't you try 211 and this is what it is? Or would you introduce the idea of long acting injectable cabotegravir or LA cab or cab LA 600 milligrams intramuscularly for prep? So I'm seeing people nodding to choice number three and raising their hands. Would anyone double down on adher adherence counseling for daily prep? New. No. Would anyone recommend 211? New. No. So um, out there in TV land, what are people saying? 85% of people would introduce the idea of long acting cab. Very interesting. Good, because that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh, so, right. So she likes the idea of an injection every two months instead of daily pills, but she has some questions. Is it as good as oral prep? How often do I have to come in for a visit? When do I get to consider myself protected from HIV? How painful is it? I don't really like shots so much. How much does it cost? And what if I don't like it? Okay, so as I said, we're gonna talk about CAB, but before we talk about CAB, there's some very interesting reanalysis of existing data on um, the, the protective dose response and protective effect of oral TDF-FTC uh, prep in persons assigned female sex at birth. So I think probably, and, and just as a caveat, I'm assuming that most people in the audience kind of have the basics of oral prep um, down. Um, and you probably have heard that in for rectal protection, um, seven doses a week is the best, 99% um, risk reduction. But if you take four doses, you're probably getting around 95% um, protection, again, for rectal protection. And that the same is not true for vaginal protection. So based on... Um, so inconsistent results from trials of daily prep uh, in, in women, um, some which showed efficacy, some which didn't, and also some interesting pharmacokinetic data on um, tissue levels of the two drugs in TDF, FTC, uh, in various sites of exposure, rectum, vagina, um, pena, uh, penis. Uh, um, the thought has been that to achieve vaginal, protect, pr vaginal protection from HIV, you need to take six to seven doses a week. Well, that has recently come under uh, question. First of all, we don't actually know whether drug levels in uh, white blood cells are uh, correlated with protection versus uh, drug levels experimentally um, in tissues at the sites of exposure. So that's come into question. And then there've been a couple of really interesting analyses of existing data. So um, Pete Anderson and his group in Colorado looked at tenofovir diphosphate levels. That's the active version of the tenofovir. Um, in a study called HPTN084, which you're gonna hear about more in a minute, that was a study of cabotegravir versus TDF-FTC in women. Um, and they correlated the drug levels that they saw in these dried blood spots um, with what they had seen in MSM. And they estimated um, that actually, if you took seven doses a week in 084, uh, you had 99% protection. If you took four to six doses a week, you actually had 88% protection, which is higher than was previously thought. So that was a little bit um, encouraging, although there was no placebo arm in that because remember in 084, it was testing cabotegravir against TDF-FTC. There was no non-drug group. So um, another group uh, did a modeling study of plasma tenofovir levels in the previously done randomized control trials of oral daily prep in women. Those were FemPrep, Voice, and Partners Prep. And they correlated those um, with what they know about the correlation between plasma tenofovir levels and these tenofovir diphosphate levels in dried blood spots from another trial called HPTN082 um, and tried to look at um, uh, in those randomized control trials of PrEP 
um, what was the protection level in people who had intermittent use. Uh, and they found that if you took seven doses a week, 96% efficacy. If you took four doses a week, about 84% efficacy. So again, not as effective. Four doses a week in women is not as effective as it is in men, but it's a lot more effective than has been previously thought. Now, is this ready for prime time? No, no one is recommending this, but it's, it's really um, got the field thinking again about uh, can we do less than daily dosing um, in people who are assigned female sex at birth? That may also have implications for two on one. I don't know. I'm not going to go there, but that's just where people are kind of starting to go with this idea. All right. So anyway, what about cabotegravir? So there were two main um, randomized control trials of cabotegravir versus oral daily prep. Uh, they were HPTN 084 and 083. 084 was in um, cisgender women. Um, 3,000 participants, they were randomized to cabotegravir, uh, first oral, uh, and then intramuscularly, 600 milligrams, um, uh, basically every two months, versus oral uh, prep. Um, and they were followed over three and a half years, and basically cases were counted. Um, and this is what they saw. So uh, if you randomized cabotegravir, um, you had an 88% decreased risk of HIV infection versus those who are randomized to oral PrEP. So that was huge and that was highly significant. Um, similarly, in 083, which was exactly the same study, but done in um, cis, MSM, and trans women, same setup, same schema, same outcomes. Um, there was a highly significant uh, difference in HIV risk if you randomized to cabotegravir versus oral PrEP. And your risk reduction was 66% uh, versus those who got oral prep. Um, so very, very effective. Cabotegravir is very, very effective. So that answers her first question, okay? Um, her second question is how often do I have to come in and does it hurt? So this is the dosing schedule for uh, intramuscular cabotegravir. Um, you get two initial injections 28 days apart. And then after that, it's every uh, eight weeks. Okay. And as long as you stay on it past the induction phase, you get an injection intramuscularly every eight weeks. So where does this injection happen? Um, so these are gluteal injections. The preferred site is ventrogluteal. And you can see in that little picture down below how to find the ventrogluteal um, uh, location to inject the needle. Dorsogluteal, which what which is what people are more used to doing in STI clinics, because that's where we give bicillin, is also acceptable. Um, what is not acceptable is intramuscular at any other site. And we're gonna go into that in a sec. So uh, does it hurt? Yes, it does hurt. So there are injection site reactions, pain, swelling, induration, which is hardening at the site of injection. Um, occasionally systemic inflammatory uh, symptoms. So people will have migratory myalgias, could have fevers, could have night sweats. Um, we saw one person at City Clinic who actually was hospitalized uh, with an injection site reaction that was thought to be cellulitis and possibly bacteremia um, based on uh, the appearance of their skin and fevers and rigors. It wasn't, it was just a really, really bad injection site reaction. Um, it starts a day or so after the injection. It peaks around day three or four. Some people uh, who have ongoing um, injection site reactions know to plan their injections such that around day three or four, they're just gonna be kind of hanging out at home. Um, things you can do to mitigate these are use heat packs, use your end set of choice, acetaminophen. Very few people in 084 and 083 discontinued CAB because of the ISRs. 2.4% uh, discontinuation. And really, remember, this is not just the pain of the needle. It's, an, it's a local inflammatory reaction. And as with subsequent injections, the severity of the injection site reactions um, is said to diminish. Um, and that's shown in this time series. So you can see over on the left about 60% of people report an injection site reaction. And then over the course of their injections, the percentage of people who are reporting them goes down, but still about 20 to 30% of people report some kind of ISR. Um, and for most people, the benefit of IM cab really outweighs the drawbacks, but for some people it doesn't and they wind up discontinuing it. 
Okay, so what about rotating your injections around? You know, give it in dorsogluteally once and then two months later, ventrogluteally, and then maybe why not try the thigh? The thigh is a big fat muscle. Well, um, that's not actually currently um, allowed, um, but is definitely been looked at. So um, over here, let me see here, is this? Yes. Okay. So looking over here first. So this, uh, I'm not going to geek out too much on the pharmacokinetics, but we have to talk about them a little bit because it's kind of interesting. So this is, you can see this is uh, week, this is time zero. This is week four and then week eight. And then every um, eight weeks after that, you can see you get an injection, your levels go way up. They start to come down about eight weeks later. They're, that are, they're about eight times what's called the protein um uh, uh, protein associated uh, 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 inhibitory concentration, 90%. Um, and it's in, in, in non-human primate studies, um, macaques did not get infected with HIV if they maintained levels above four times the PAIC, okay? So you get your injection, this is in the glute, it comes down at about eight weeks, you're at eight times the PAIC, that's great. At 12 weeks, you're getting close to four or below. You get another injection, it goes up, it comes down, you get another, that's okay. That's kind of the typical pharmacokinetic curve for these injections. Everyone's a little bit different. Um, okay, so then over here, this is a group that looked at thigh injections. And they actually found basically the same pharmacokinetics. At eight weeks, you're just approaching the uh, four times the PAIC 90. And then um, at 12 weeks, you're actually dipping below. So this is deemed promising for future studies. This is not deemed ready for prime time. So uh, we do not currently recommend thigh injections, although some people, if there's no other choice, are doing it. Okay, But it's not standard of care. Why are we considering this besides rotating injection sites? So people who would benefit from Cab LA, sometimes they have implants, they have butt implants, or if they can't afford butt implants, they have butt injections with substances that are silicone or something else. And how, how do you know that the needle that you're using to inject the cab tracker is actually getting to muscle versus getting into a big glob of silicone? Well, that's difficult. So with, um, Actual implants, um, an astute nurse can feel around the periphery of the implant. Uh, and if there's glute muscle um, beyond the perimeter of the implant, inject there. For fillers, it's a little trickier because fillers just kind of diffuse into tissue and you don't really know where they are. Um, and some clinics, including uh, over here at Ward 86, have gone so far as to do CT scans of folks who have fillers to delineate where the filler is and where the muscle is. I think that's pretty, um, that's pretty dedicated, that's pretty assiduous. I don't know that everyone has access to doing that. But I think uh, if you know that someone or someone tells you that they have gluteal fillers or uh, gluteal implants, um, that's gonna affect where you put the needle. And in extreme cases, you might consider doing a thigh injection or as I, but as I said, that's not currently standard of care, but just in case it comes up because things come up. All right. So, and while we're on the subject of PK, okay. So cab tegover, it stays in your body for a long time, up to a year or longer in this sort of tailing off diminishing concentration. And at some point, the concentration of CAB is no longer gonna be protective and you're gonna be at risk for HIV. So um, after that point, we, we think it's probably uh, two months after your last injection, you need to start using an alternate form of HIV prevention, whether it is PEP for occasional exposures, condoms, oral prep, not having sex, whatever, just people need to be counseled that there is this tail. If they stop, they can totally stop. But at about eight weeks after their last injection, they're going to need to start using some other form of HIV prevention. Okay. So um, she tests HIV negative and her first injection is scheduled to arrive in clinic in five days. So that's all good. She wants to know, well, when am I protected? All right, we don't, the, the real answer is we don't know exactly. It's probably sometime in the first week after your first injection, based again on non-human primate studies. Um, uh, early on, 
uh, people were entertaining the idea of, well, maybe if someone's on oral prep and switching to CAB, we sh they should stay on their oral prep until a week after their first injection, or if they're not on oral prep and they're starting CAB, we should put them on oral prep until a week after their first injection. I gave a version of this talk in December at the Medical Management of HIV course, and like three quarters of the people in the audience said, yes, we would do that. And the panelists said, no, we would not do that. And I think that, that, that idea um, is falling out of favor. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, in the trials, people did fine without being on Truvada up until the, the end of their first week after their injection. And again, you're, you're often um, asking someone who wants an injection and doesn't wanna take pills to take pills that doesn't exactly inspire trust and confidence. It's not what they want. You want to encourage them to use an HIV prevention method that they want to use and that they're going to use. So um, I think that is falling out of favor. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip that slide. So in answer to her questions, is it as good as oral prep? Oral prep is very, very effective. LA cab, it might be better for you if it works for you and you can take it, okay? When am I protected? Sometime within the first week after your first injection, they gotta know that. How often do I have to come in? Every two months after the first two doses. How painful are the shots? For some people, they're very painful. It tends to get better over time. There's some things you can do to make it less painful. And what if I don't like it? You can always stop, but be aware of the tail and the need for HIV prevention, an alternate form of HIV prevention, starting about eight weeks after your last injection. Okay, how am I doing on time? Doing okay. So she gets her first, in, all right, you're gonna have to start thinking about dates here, okay? Um, she gets her first injection as planned on July 5th. She gets her second injection August 2nd, 28 days later. She gets her third injection September 27th on time. The injection site reactions are becoming less uncomfortable. Um, and her HIV RNA tests at each injection are negative, and we're gonna go into why we're doing HIV RNA tests in a minute. However, she misses her fourth injection appointment, which is scheduled for November 22nd. On December 18th, she comes to clinic to get that fourth injection. I was in LA working and I couldn't make it back up to the Bay Area. So to make things easier for you, here's the calendar, all right? So here's my pointer. So this was her third injection, right? This was her scheduled fourth injection that she missed. And now she comes to clinic on the 18th. Okay. So thought question, on December 18th, would you give the fourth injection and just continue every eight week dosing? Would you reinduce her with two injections 28 days apart and then switch to every eight week dosing? So basically starting from scratch again, because maybe it's been too long. Or would you say, you know, this just isn't working for you. Let's go back to oral prep. Okay. So um, audience here, who wants to give the fourth injection? Keep going. Who wants to reinduce her? Okay. Who wants to throw in the towel and go back to pills? <laughs> Zero. How about out there in the virtual world? It's we love you, pretty, we wanna hear from it, you. Yes, it's split. It's 59% would reinduce with the two injections. 37% would give the fourth injection and continue every eight week doses. Interesting. I didn't give you a lot of time to like count weeks. Um, so, Either of those first two choices would be totally safe, okay? I'm just gonna say that. Um, so here's how you deal with this question. So actually, she was just shy of 12 weeks since her last injection. Or another way to think of that is she was just shy of four weeks since her missed injection. So it's totally okay to keep going with the every two months, okay? Um, but you have to really whip out your calendars and like count weeks, okay? So here's how you deal with this problem. So here's the dosing schedule again up top, right? Two doses, four weeks apart, and then every eight weeks after that. So for late injections that are unplanned, if the second injection is missed and the time since the first injection is less than or equal to eight weeks, meaning you're less than or equal to four weeks late, 
um, just keep going. If the second injection is missed and the time since the first injection is more than eight weeks, then you have to restart. Once you're in the continuation phase, so planned third injection on, if the time since the last injection is less than or equal to 12 weeks, you can keep going with every two months. If it's more than 12 weeks, then you have to restart uh, with the two doses one month apart, okay? There's two different schools of thought on how you should think about that. One is you should look at weeks since the last injection. The other is you should look at weeks um, since the missed injection. It was whatever works for you. I happen to like weeks since last injection. Other people find it easier to think about weeks since the missed injection, okay? So for missed injections, um, if it's a week before or a week after the plan date, don't worry about it. There's a, there's a 14 day period around the date of the in, uh, injection that's a totally acceptable window period. Um, if someone knows they're going to be away or not gonna be able to get their planned injection, they should start daily prep eight weeks after their last injection and continue it until um, they get their missed injection, okay? What does that oral prep consist of? Well, there, it turns out there's an oral version of cabotegravir called Vocabria 30 milligrams. You can get that from a specialty pharmacy if you're already prescribed um, I am cabotegravir uh, for use for these gaps, or you can just use uh, TDF FTC uh, if that's more convenient. But you do wanna start coverage eight weeks after your last injection for reasons having to do with that PK sawtooth curve that I showed you. And the fact that there is individual variation uh, among people as to how quickly their levels drop. Okay. So what about lab monitoring on long acting cab? So STIs monitored baseline, and then people are coming in every two months. So you get to choose is, are you gonna test them every, screen them every two months, every four months, every six months. I think that's an area of some debate. Uh, at City Clinic, we do it every four months. Um, no renal monitoring, no hepatic monitoring. It's really nice. Okay, what about HIV monitoring on PrEP? Okay, so um, in HBTN 083 and 084, remember this was comparing people on cabotegravir to oral PrEP, there were breakthrough infections um, in both arms. And in both arms, there was delayed detection of HIV infection. Um, and the average delay in the cabotegravir arms was if someone actually had a baseline HIV infection, meaning they had kind of occult acute HIV infection when they started, the, the, the median number of days that that, that infection was, um, that the diagnosis of that infection was delayed is 62. If you got infected on cabotegravir, it was 98 days. So people were living with HIV on sub-suppressive therapy for two months, three to four months, okay? That's not good. In the oral prep arm, similar story, a little bit less dire. Uh, for baseline infections, the median time uh, of delay was 34 days. And for incident infections while you were on drug was 31 days. Okay, so this led to a lot of consternation. And one reason this happened is that the HIV testing that they were doing during those trials was antigen antibody testing. So they weren't doing viral load testing in real time. They did store the samples and went back and then looked at the actual date of first infection using RNA. And it was substantially earlier than it was detected using, in real time using antigen antibody testing. So all of that led to CDC to come up with this recommendation that everyone on PrEP, whether it's oral or injectable, should um, be monitored using HIV RNA assays. That is highly controversial. Not everyone has access to that. Depending on your insurance, it's prohibitively expensive. Um, so I would say there's enormous pushback in the field about monitoring people using HIV RNA assays on oral PrEP. Um, and I would go so far as to say it's not necessary. Um, we happen to do it at City Clinic because we do screen using pooled RNA assays, which make it economically much more affordable. And in terms of person power, 
uh, doable. Most sites don't have access to that. Ward 86 doesn't do that in their um, PrEP program. They use antigen antibody testing and have very, very good outcomes, okay? For monitoring people on CAB, I think that it, I, I think the case for using HIV RNA assays for monitoring people on CAB is a little more easy to make because the consequences of uh, this delayed um, diagnosis of HIV infection on, CAB, on, on subsequent um, antiretroviral use is more serious in people who acquire HIV on cabotegravir. They often uh, become infected and then develop um, in, uh, resistance mutations to the integrase inhibitor class of meds, which are really a mainstay of treatment. We don't want that to happen. Their HIV can be treated just fine. It just, it removes a, a very potent and well-tolerated class of meds from their, um, from their choices. Okay. All right. Um, wrong button. Okay. So just a quick, um, summary of the HIV infections that were seen in the 083 trial of cabotegravir, okay? So just bottom line, I want to point this out, like we're really, really, really worried about these 34 HIV infections that happened, right? But there were 2,282 people. That's a lot of people who did not get HIV on cabotegravir, all right? Just for bottom line, 2,282. But we're going to talk about the 34, okay? So when did they get infected? So there's group A, they, the, the investigators grouped these people. Group A was people who actually had occult HIV at baseline, okay? Um, there were four of them. When they went back and looked at their HIV RNA, um, they had no INSD mutations at their first indication of HIV infection. And then one person did wind up developing INSD mutations because of the delay, okay? Group B, people who got infected at least six months after their last injection. That was the bulk of folks. They had non-protective levels of cabotegravir in their system, right? 16 people. Luckily, none of them developed in steam mutations at any test. So that's very reassuring. It's somewhat reassuring about that tail too. It's a little, you know, this is just the first 2,200 people on cab. So watch that space. Maybe we'll see bad things happening during the tail, but this was very reassuring. C, so this is people, so I didn't really dwell on this, but in the, in 084 and 083, people started with about up to four weeks of oral cabotegravir before switching to the IM. And that was really to see if it was tolerable. It was tolerable for everyone. Um, oral cab is not there to boost your levels before you get the, the, the injection is really there to make sure that you don't have a, a bad reaction to cabotegravir. No one had a bad reaction aside from injection site reactions. Very few people actually use that oral lead-in with cabotegravir. And here's another reason why, because three people got infected during the oral lead-in. So that sucks. Uh, so, and two of them developed INSTE mutations. So I, I wouldn't do it. Um, Okay, so this group is the one that we really are worried about. These are people who got infected despite having on-time in injections. Okay, they didn't miss any injections. Everything went the way it was supposed to go. Six people got infected. Two of them had INST mutations at the first visit at which they had a positive HIV RNA. And um, all six eventually developed them. Remember, this all happened before they knew they had HIV. Their antigen antibody testing was negative. It was only after they went back and tested the stored samples that they found that, that they actually had HIV at the time, okay? Um, and then DX and BR, these two groups, um, so um, these were infected less than six months after their last injection with at least one delay. So really delayed injections are a problem. And that's why if someone knows they're gonna miss an injection, they should be counseled to start oral prep uh, eight weeks after their last injection. You don't want a gap to open up, okay? Um, and then this is, uh, these are two people who had had no cab in the six months before their first HIV positive visit. They restarted on or after their first visit. 
and had HIV infection either before, not detected, or at their first visit, that there was a delayed diagnosis, okay? It's a relatively small group of people. So the bottom line here is um, HIV detection is delayed by weeks or months when only antigen antibody testing is used in cabotegravir. Um, there was no insti resistance when the HIV infection occurred more than six months after their last injection. That's some reassurance. HIV testing would have detected infection before the development of insti resistance mutations in 80% of folks who did eventually develop insti resistance. So that is one of the main reasons why I think there's still a case to be made for using HIV uh, RNA monitoring and people using CAB. The other good news is that in the people who did get infected, um, they most suppressed on very readily available regimens. So um, boosted darunavir plus tenofovir plus FTC, so basically Simtuza, for those of you who are um, HIV clinicians, or um, a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, usually um, a drug that we use now called deravirine plus tenofovir plus FTC or 3TC. So very well-tolerated standard acceptable regimens and they suppressed, okay? All right. So um, this phenomenon of uh, delayed HIV diagnosis has acquired a term called Levi. Um, and it's really specifically for people who acquire HIV on long acting cabotegravir. And over here, you see the, the typical acute HIV infection in the absence of PrEP. So it's a phase of natural HIV infection. It's a new infection. It's the viral replication tends to be explosive. Often people are symptomatic with the flu-like syndrome. It's very easy to diagnose actually using available tests, whether it's antigen antibody or HIV RNA. Um, the assay, the, the tests don't turn negative, okay? They're positive, they stay positive. Um, it takes, it, it, it lasts about one to two weeks. Transmission is highly likely during this period because their viral load, their viral load is super high. Um, and there's usually not worry about developing drug resistance. They may have been infected with a drug resistant strain, but they're not gonna acquire it. Contrast that with Levi, which is seen in people taking long acting ARVs for PrEP. It's infection during PrEP um, or initiation of PrEP during acute undetected HIV infection. The viral replication is smoldering, i.e. low level. Usually no symptoms. Detection is much more challenging um, using ultra-sensitive RNA assays, uh, RNA normal viral load tests, HIV DNA assays. Often um, these tests are masked, they're blunted during Levi syndrome, as is um, an antigen antibody test. Okay, so it can be completely hidden. Um, their assay reversion is very common for all test types. So if you were to plot out someone's various kinds of tests, you would see wacky things like their antigen antibody is positive and then it's negative. Their viral load is positive and it's negative. And then it's negative and then it's positive. You see these weird combinations and you just have to be really persistent and test people until you have convincing evidence that they have HIV. Um, uh, it lasts until there's viral breakthrough such that any uh, nucleic acid test will be positive, um, or, uh, or they finally seroconvert, meaning their antibody turns positive. Um, transmission is very unlikely during this because the viral load is actually very, very low, so that's good. Um, and drug resistance, as we've seen in the previous slide, can emerge and often does emerge during Levi. Okay, so what happens if someone does get infected while taking um, LA cab, do a genotype test, including integrase resistance, and start HIV treatment right away, and use usually a boosted PI protease inhibitor plus two nukes, okay, until you get your test results back. And then you'll know whether you need to continue that or whether you can put them on something like Bictegravir or TAF FTC uh, because there's no instant uh, resistance. All right, so um, some other important lessons learned, 20 minutes, okay, good. Um, other important lessons learned as we have rolled out Cab LA, and I wanna give a big shout out to Montika Levy, who's in the audience, and Christopher Ruiz, who's in the virtual audience. Um, they are partners in crime. They, uh, 
have developed the biomedical prevention program at San Francisco City Clinic with a group of fantastic PrEP, PEP, and DoxyPEP navigators um, and are responsible for our experience with Cab LA. Um, so some things that we and they have learned. So um, you can only get cabotegravir LA from specialty pharmacies. It's not like you can send your patient to Walgreens and say, hey, go get your syringe and bring it in or inject at home. They don't do this at home. Uh, so it has to be delivered to clinic. It is covered by Medi-Cal. If you don't have Medi-Cal or commercial insurance, there is a patient assistance program for uninsured folks making less than five times the federal poverty limit from the drug manufacturer. If you have commercial insurance, getting on cab is very complicated. Um, and it has to do with how different insurance companies and different insurance plans within each company consider this treatment. Is it a pharmacy benefit? Is it a medical benefit? Because it requires a procedure at a medical clinic. I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but it makes cab LA complex for people with commercial insurance. Other lessons that we've learned. Discontinuations due to the injection site reaction are not uncommon. We've built up a little stockpile of unused medication in our basement because people just didn't want to get any more injections. We have to figure out what to do with that. Um, remember, visits are actually more frequent than they are for oral prep. It's every two months, right? Whereas for daily prep, it's every three months. For 211, it's whenever, right? Like it should be every three months, but people often don't. So um, at scale, doing cab LA is very labor intensive for the navigators. If you're just doing it one off in your primary care uh, clinic for one patient or two patients, it's not such a big lift. If you have a cab LA program, your navigators, whoever's doing it, are going to be running around doing a lot of communication with the pharmacy, with the benefits programs, um, reminding people to come in when their injection arrives at the clinic. There's a lot of person time. What do we do with unused doses? However, people who love it, they really, really, really love it, okay? All right, so um, take homes, very effective for HIV prevention, regardless of your sex at birth. Um, adding CAB to your PrEP toolkit may expand uptake. I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but there's really interesting data from East Africa showing that um, when CAB LA was added to um, daily oral PrEP, PrEP starts, people who'd never been on PrEP before jumped by 30%. So like we saw when 2-1-1 hit the scene, the more choices you give people about their PrEP, the more likely they're going to use PrEP. So I think that is really one of the major breakthroughs in cab LA. Um, antibody antigen testing, screening for HIV infection will miss rare HIV infections on cab LA. HIV RNA screening will detect infections before the development of INSTI mutations in most cases. Time since last injection determines when to continue versus restarting after missed injection. And injection site reactions, insurance, visit schedule remain potential barriers. Okay, so we have about 17 minutes left, but before we go to case two, any questions? Yeah, and who, tell me who you are. Um, my name is Alexis, I work as a nurse in the clinic in Marin. Okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify and ask, so are you testing the HIV at the time of injection or a few days before at injection. the time of injection that's awesome okay yeah that's great yep okay allison any questions from the audience okay people are having lunch all right um so case two uh 37 year old cisgender man who has sex with men he's prescribed doxypep he's uh been hiv he's been living with hiv since 2019 it's well controlled. He's on Bictegravir TAF FTC. His T cells are 830. Um, a partner that he topped and bottomed with two weeks ago texted him yesterday to report being diagnosed with chlamydia. And we ask the question like, okay, who did what with whom? What was exposed? He said, everyone did everything with everyone. Um, he has no symptoms of pharyngitis, proctitis, or urethritis. His STI testing two months ago was negative. He had negative NATs for gonorrhea and chlamydia at all sites of exposure. Um, his RPR was one to two, but he's serofast at one to two, which better me explained what that is. He's had eight partners in the last three months. He has condomless receptive and insertive anal sex and oral sex with everybody. Um, 
And he takes doxycycline, 200 milligrams, within 72 hours of condomless sex with all his partners except his boyfriend. Um, and he says he did take it after sex with his contact. So doxypep. Um, Stephanie explained how well it works and what we've seen in the trials. This is how you take it. So um, typically, uh, so this little heart with the two people is a sex event. Um, so the, these two people uh, had sex Thursday mid to late, uh, and they took their doxypep uh, 24 hours later. They could have waited up to 72 hours. Um, si similarly, these two people, or maybe the same person, um, had sex on Saturday and took it about 48 hours later and could have waited up to um, 72 hours. That's example one. Example two is someone um, who is having daily or more frequent sex from Saturday to Tuesday. So they take doxypep, they like, they're a 24 hour person. So they take it every 24 hours, depending on when they had sex, okay? So the way doxypep is recommended is take 200 milligrams as soon as possible after condomless anal or oral sex. Um, preferably within 24 hours, you can wait up to 72 hours, but don't take more than 200 milligrams in any 24 hour period. Okay, that's how it's given. That's how it was studied. That's how we recommend taking it. Okay, so why? Um, so this was the doxypep trial. Um, this was done in four clinics in the US, two in San Francisco, two in Seattle. It was uh, two STI clinics, two HIV clinics. Um, the entry criteria were male sex at birth, living with HIV or HIV negative on PrEP, at least one STI, bacterial STI in the last 12 months, and condomless sex with at least one male partner in the last 12 months. People got quarterly three-site GCT testing and an RPR um, and GC culture before treatment. Um, this is what the schema looked like, okay? Um, there was a two to one randomization of people doxypep versus standard of care. This was not a placebo controlled trial. It was doxypep versus standard of care. Um, and it was stopped early by the data safety and monitoring board because there was such a big difference in outcomes. Um, and this is what they saw. So this is in the PrEP cohort. This is in the, in the living with HIV cohort. Overall, there was a 65% reduction in getting gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis uh, within uh, uh, the, the, the following quarter, okay? So they looked at quarterly incidents. Um, and you can see the drops are quite astounding. Uh, they were a little bit different, excuse me, by pathogen. So for chlamydia in the PrEP group, the reduction, was, reduction in incidence was 88%. In the HIV group, it was 74%. For syphilis, it was 87% and 77% uh, in people living with HIV. Gonorrhea, a little bit less impressive. It was still a significant drop, but about 50%-ish in both groups, okay? And uh, Stephanie talked about why that might be. There's higher circulating ra rates of um, uh, tetracycline resistance in gonorrhea. They're about 20, 25% here. They're 90 to 100% in France. Um, uh, and all of these differences, however, were significant. In the, in the for syphilis, the, the reduction in incidence was not quite significant in the people living with HIV, but that's really probably due to low numbers of cases, okay? There's also data on, on efficacy by site, but we're not gonna go into that. So very impressive results. So um, the question came up earlier this morning, well, what about antimicrobial resistance? You're giving all these people intermittent doxycycline, isn't that gonna breed super bugs? It's definitely a concern. Are you gonna change the gut microbiome because you're giving people all this doxycycline? Definitely a concern. All these things are being studied and I'm not like diminishing them. I'm not poo-pooing them. They're real, but um, I think the consensus is among most people that the astounding um, efficacy of doxypep in reducing STIs at the individual and clinic level. And then what you saw in Maddie Sankaran's data citywide the benefits probably at this point outweigh the potential risks and that we're studying the risks to better delineate them and see if they're truly risks. So um, this is from a, a poster at Croy, uh, sorry, a talk at Croy in 2023, looking at um, the questions of does doxypep drive increased tetracycline resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea? Well, so what they've found so far is that um, uh, Yes, there was 
uh, in, in people on doxypep, there, was a, there were higher rates of tetracycline resistance, but it's not clear at all that those were um, due to acquired tetracycline resistance. Um, doxypep didn't work as well in people who had gonorrhea that was resistant to tetracycline. So what about, what's the effect of doxypep on the carriage of staph aureus, including methicillin resistant staph aureus? So, you know, staph aureus lives in our nose, it lives on our skin. Um, it doesn't really cause damage there. If it gets into parts of your body where it shouldn't be, like the bloodstream, it can be terrible. Doxycycline is actually one of the drugs that's used to treat uh, staph aureus in certain um, uh, circumstances. It would be a real bummer to lose that. Um, so what's the effect? So, so far, um, doxypep use was associated with a 14% de percent decrease in colonization, meaning having staph aureus just living on your body. Um, there was an 8% increase in doxycycline resistance compared to baseline in people who were on doxypep, um, but numbers were very, very low. So it's hard to say too much about that. Um, MRSA prevalence was very low in folks and it did not change with doxypep use. So that's also somewhat encouraging. And then the last question is, what's the effect of doxypep on what are called commensal Neisseria species in the pharynx? So we have Neisseria gonorrhea that can live in the pharynx. We have Neisseria meningitis that can live in the pharynx. We have Neisseria whatever that can live in the pharynx, okay? These are very gregarious bugs. They pick up resistance mutations. They share genes with other Neisseria. They share genes. It's sort of amazing. It's perfect for gonorrhea. It likes to assort with other bacteria. Right, And it can trade genes back and forth. And so there's concern that the pharynx with all of these commensal Neisseria species is a place where um, they're gonna pick up antibiotic resistance and share it with their um, friends and neighbors. Um, so yes, two thirds of isolates had pre-existing doxycycline resistance um, before starting doxypep, but there was no significant change associated with doxypep use. Does this mean that antibiotic resistance is not an issue, is not a concern? It does not, but the initial data at the very least are not alarming. And this really requires more study um, and good uh, anti antimicrobial resistance surveillance um, at sentinel sites that prescribe a lot of doxypep. Um, what about doxypep in women? So there was a doxypep trial in East Africa called the DPEP trial that did not show efficacy. That was extremely upsetting and disappointing. Um, there was no difference uh, in outcomes, people who got doxypep or not. Um, Self-reported adherence was high through quarterly surveys um, and weekly SMSs. It turns out that when you looked actually at doxycycline levels in hair, there were pretty strong signals that people were not taking their doxycycline and this may have been an adherence issue. So in a randomly selected subset of 50 participants in DPEP, um, only 56% had doxycycline detected at least once in their hair samples, meaning 44% never had doxy detected in their hair samples. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of activity in this space reinterpreting the data, planning other studies, because obviously the implications uh, of being able to use doxypep in people assigned female sex at birth, where the burden of STIs is super, super high, uh, is really, really important. I will say that at City Clinic, we do on a case-by-case -case basis give doxypep to cisgender women, and we, we, don't, we don't have a large number of trans men, but um, the trans men that we do see are at high risk for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Um, and we have given doxypep to trans men in our clinic. Um, and they really, really, really like it. Um, so counseling patients about doxypep, I'm going to, uh, I have to speed up a little bit. So it's a really shared decision making to support patients' choice. Um, it's important to do a self, uh, an assessment of their risk of STI. We review what we know about doxypep's effectiveness and what we don't know about its risks with patients. Um, we review how to use it. We acknowledge the unknowns. Um, and again, we offer this in, a, in the context of a comprehensive package of sexual health services 
um, Montika and team created this amazing uh, patient take-home sheet, which is great for patients. It's also great for providers to remind us how to counsel folks. It's available. If you need it, let us know. Um, okay, so back to our patient. So remember, asymptomatic contact to chlamydia um, is taking doxypep, took it after sex within the, the, the recommended time frame um, with the partner in question. Um, what would you do? Would you go ahead and treat for chlamydia with, with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days, even though the person's on doxypep? Or would you wait for test results provided the patient is contactable and promises to abstain from sex and answer his phone? So in the audience, who would test and wait? Uh-huh. Who would just go ahead and treat? It's fine if you wanna go ahead and treat, that's totally fine. No judgment. What about online? Well, split exactly half. Ha, fascinating. Okay. Um, so CDC, prior to doxypep, recommends empiric treatment for people who are contacts to gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, early syphilis, okay? That's what CDC says. Um, we are probably giving antibiotics to a lot of people who don't need it, okay? If you look at 2014 to 2018, about 66% of people who were given empiric therapy for gonorrhea or chlamydia actually didn't wind up having it. That's a very glass half full, glass half empty. Other people will say, oh my God, 30% of people had it and we have to empirically treat them all. That's, that's a personal thing. Um, so um, personally, I agree with the folks. For chlamydia, I think it's like pretty clear. I would test and wait as long as the patient is comfortable with that. If the patient wants empiric therapy, that's another story. For gonorrhea, I would probably test and wait. Although... We know that doxypep is less effective. I would really wanna make sure that the person is contactable, will abstain from sex and will come in. Syphilis, no. Window period too long. Serology, if, if someone doesn't have like an obvious shanker, which they wouldn't from a contact two weeks ago, there's no sense in, 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 in not treating them empirically for syphilis if they're, if they're a contact, okay? I think that's pretty obvious. Um, so here's how we do doxypep at City Clinic. Either it comes during a clinician visit um, and it's introduced there, or our prep, our biomedical prevention counselors introduce it at a telephone consultation. Um, we get we counsel on how to use the knowns and unknowns. We apply eligibility per uh, SFDPH city guidance. The counselor sends an e-prescription for doxycycline, 100 milligrams, to the patient's pharmacy, number 60, no refills. Or if they have no insurance, doxycycline is so cheap that we've bought cases of it and we will dispense uh, 100 tablets, no refills to people who are uninsured. That's because it comes in bottles of 50. Um, the SIG is doxycycline 200 milligrams, PRN, PO daily, not to exceed 200 milligrams in a 24 hour period. And we don't prescribe refills. The patient calls the BMP line for refills as needed. And every three months, uh, we try to do gonorrhea chlamydia site uh, testing at all sites, syphilis screening and HIV screening. Most of these people are on PrEP already, so they're getting that. So a couple of observations from the first year of the program. Uptake has been very high, 75% uh, among people who had at least one STI in the previous year, 60% for people who had no STI but two partners in the last year. Almost 90% of those who prescribed it used it, but they didn't use it with every condomless event. So people pick and choose a little bit. Um, and even so, we saw good efficacy in our, or effectiveness in our, in our data that Stephanie showed. There is some confusion about whether they're taking doxyprep or doxypep. We have people come in and they've actually been taking doxy every day and they didn't need to. Some people did need to. Um, we get occasional requests. People come in saying, I, I just had sex and I, can you give me 200 milligrams of doxycycline? And we'll say, yes, we can, but we're actually going to give you um, 60 pills and you're going to enroll in doxypep because it's probably going to happen again. Um, so that's it. Um, we're not going to do case three. Any questions? Okay, and we are, we are right on time. So, any, um, so how about a question from the online audience first? Okay, because the dosing can be a little tricky. If someone engages in unprotected sex on day one, then day two, and day three, will doxypep provide protection for all three possible exposures if taken within 72 hours from day one exposure? We think it will. 
We don't think that there's so many STIs running around that they overwhelm the little molecules of doxycycline. And then we're getting some questions about um, blood labs at follow up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I forgot to mention that the package insert for chronic doxycycline use recommends doing um, LFTs or actually transaminases once a year. Um, so that's currently what we're doing, if that's what the question is asking. CDC has not weighed in on whether they recommend annual um, AST ALT monitoring. Is there, um, is there more questions online? Oh, well, it, I'll take a question in the room if there is a question in the room about either doxypep or cabotegravir. No questions in the room. Okay, Allison, how about one more online? Can you talk about tolerability of doxypep? I've heard reports of intense GI symptoms. Any mitigation strategies? Yeah, that's great. So um, some people will have GI distress to doxycycline. So we recommend taking it with food, but not hope not having doxycycline and dairy products or bivalent cations in your stomach at the same time. So if you're taking vitamin supplements, you might want to space those out. Uh, but taking it with food may help GI side effects. Definitely take it with a big glass of water and don't lie down for 30 minutes afterwards. We want the doxycycline to go all the way down, not get stuck and cause pillow esophagitis halfway down. Yep. And also, um, you know, doxycycline will, call, doxycycline will cause sun sensitivity in some people. So be aware, slap on some sunscreen, a caftan, a big hat. Uh, I see two questions in the room. So I'm gonna start over here. I saw your hand first, Marianne. Uh, it wasn't a question, just also an add-on for people who are doing any sort of laser hair removal or um, oh. laser tattoo removal. Talk with the technician who's running that because they have uh, they recommend uh, abstaining for certain periods of time. So that folks who are getting their so laser hair removal or trans clients want to counsel them on that, especially. Thank you for that. Do they get burned basically from the laser? Yeah. Got it. So he's saying hypersensitivity to the laser for the virtual audience. Do you want a penis? Okay. <laughs> you have those. Okay. I'm no, I know the hats are gone. I needed more hats. I'm so sorry. Okay. I see a hand over here. What is your opinion on somebody who already have uh, chlamydia and then has sex with his partner and took uh, the doxy pap from his partner because they said it's a good thing to prevent from getting chlamydia, but they already have it. Without knowing it. Oh, oh. Um, I would not use 200 milligrams of doxycycline to treat an STI if that's kind of the underlying question. Yeah. Okay. Right, 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 right. Um, we don't actually know because that hasn't specifically been studied. I think if, for example, let's say a week later, they get contacted by a partner who says, I have chlamydia, and they came in for testing, we might find that they have chlamydia. I doubt that 200 milligrams would cure their chlamydia, but we would just treat them for chlamydia at that stage. Oh, I, that's a great, great question. Sorry, I did not cover this. So yeah, so what's the consequence of, of taking doxycycline if you already have chlamydia? So the, the question I think you're answering is, are you gonna foster drug resistance in chlamydia by taking doxy, a little bit of doxycycline if you have chlamydia? No. So we've been using doxycycline, we, the big we, right? Have been using doxycycline to treat chlamydia and treat syphilis for decades. Neither of those organisms has developed tetracycline resistance, unlike gonorrhea. I should have included that in the resistance slide. So we're not very worried about developing doxycycline resistance in those two bugs. The worry for resistance is, are we going to increase the amount of tetracycline resistance in circulating strains of gonorrhea? And, or are we going to induce drug resistance in other bacteria through sharing of resistance genes that are provoked by the use of intermittent doxycycline. Those are the open questions on resistance. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you. This is uh, regarding CAB and HIV testing. So yeah. you were you were talking about how serologies can be quite wacky. You can have RNA yeah. detectable, undetectable, antigen antibody detectable, undetectable, or reactive, non-reactive. Can you speak to the decision to use just RNA versus both RNA and antigen antibody at the time of uh, bimonthly injections? Um. It's a really interesting question. I think using RNA only is going to decrease the risk of HIV, of undetected HIV infection. So we'll prevent in most cases, um, most cases, uh, that Levi syndrome and all of the diagnostic conundrums that come with it. I can see a role for doing antigen antibody and, um, well, let me dial that back. I can see a role for doing antibody and viral load plus minus antigen uh, when you test, because you know there is the possibility if someone does become HIV infected, either the antibody or the viral load will be positive when the other one isn't, and you'll get this weird discordance of test results. Um, so, you know, what we do is we, yeah, I mean, we, it, it's, I can see the rationale for doing both, but hopefully using RNA testing will prevent the problem in the first place. Do we have any other questions in the room? Oh, from better me, Marion and Terry, what do I do? Oh my God, this pressure. Okay. You already asked a question. So I'm going to go to you guys fight amongst yourselves. <laughs> Give better me. I'm going to give it to better me. Um, when are the data about the um, <clears throat> gut microbiome and mycoplasma genitalium going to come out? Um, Dr. Cohen, would you like to take that question? <laughs> um, the mycoplasma genitalium data from the DoxyPep study are being analyzed and going to be submitted to the STD prevention conference, which is in September. The microbiome and um, data, there was a poster from someone um, on the team, Victoria Chu, PEDS ID fellow um, at UCSF who looked at the um, rectal swabs and stool data from DoxyPep and basically found that there was some upregulation in the gut of tetracycline resistance genes, but there was not upregulation of um, resistance genes to other antibiotics. And that is one of the concerns, like, could we actually end up causing resistance to other classes of antibiotics, that would be really, really concerning. And that was not seen. So, um, and, and then as far as like the diversity of bacteria in the gut, there was not um, an impact on that in this initial analysis. So that was good news, but still more to come. It's very, very, very complicated and hard to study the microbiome. That was one of our lessons learned. Okay, I have to close us out because we have two minutes and you guys all have a life. I know you do. Um, so, Oliver, thank you so much. How about a round of applause for Dr. Oliver Bacon? Okay. So just some housekeeping items within the next 24 hours are going to get a evaluation. Um, even if you're not getting continuing education credits, fill out the evaluation, tell us what you liked, tell us what you didn't like. We absolutely look at those and we will alter our trainings accordingly. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for being here because this is a great field. This work is hard, it is underfunded, but we are so happy that you came here and I wanna give a prize to welcome someone into the field. Is there anybody here in the room who has been in their role for less, for, uh, for a month or less? No, how about um, less than three months? Okay, welcome, I'm gonna give you, I'm giving you a book. <laughs> welcome to the field, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>